you to have met Craig. This is Levi. Levi Craig. Hello, Craig Dykers. Howdy. <coughs> okay, guys. Is this it? I feel like you're going to saw through the table and jettison it into the sea or something. <laughs> yeah, there's oh, a half a table down there. Come on down. Is anyone sitting around the edge? Sitting around the table is better. Or that, come on. At least closer. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. What is it? What's that? Who did the diagram? Where there's the next row behind you? Me, me. That was you. That was you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all blending together now. So uh, we're very, very honored uh, to have around the table uh, people who are speakers, but people who, in their own rights, um, could easily have addressed the full symposium yesterday. And I, I'm very, very grateful uh, for Levi Bryant being here. Uh, and for Ian Burgos being here, uh, and for all of you um, that just came, uh, and I should say, and Peter Waldman, I'm sorry, um, that have come some distance just to be here and to be uh, part of this without uh, you know, uh, being on stage, so to speak, so much. Um, the people that we see, such as Ian and uh, Levi, were there, should we say, <laughs> the inception of the thought that there was um, uh, a kind of, that there was a lacuna in philosophy proper um, that in the shadow of Heidegger. Um, Heidegger's influence, it seems to me, has been uh, huge, especially in architecture, mainly through one essay, uh, Building Dwelling Thinking. Um, and. Uh, and to find sort of critiques of Heidegger or find ways out of his style of phenomenology is something that perhaps begins in earnest um, uh, with Graham. Uh, those of us, who, and with his colleagues here, I'm not aware of the intimate history of those moments and those times when you knew something new was being uh, formed. But here we are, what, 20 years later? Less, um, less than that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're not that old. Six, <laughs> six years since yeah. we got together. <coughs> Excuse my perspective yeah. is warped. <laughs> uh, for me, it is a day. Um, mm -hmm. It was really the 2000 ish, right? 2001, yeah, you know, sort of when you uh, and Graham released. Two, when was your first? Two, 2002 was when? Tool Wing. But I was working on those ideas in the late 90s yeah. as part of my dissertation. Yeah, and I think, I think what often happens when some idea or person comes to prominence. Mm -hmm. You go, they burst upon the scene. And then you do a little homework and you realize, you know, yeah, they've been bursting for like 15 years all by themselves <laughs> uh, without much notice that, you know, the 10,000 hours or the 20,000 hours it takes to put something together is invisible. Until well, suddenly. Yeah. It, uh, also, the kind of randomness. Um, and there's a randomness yeah. to it as well. Yeah. I mean, if. I don't know how you want to handle this, so you just well, tell me to stop I, I'm talking. I'm going to stop at a question, but yeah. you just go for it. Oh, I was just going to tell a, a, a funny story, or maybe it's not funny, but it's it a story. It's a Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I'd known that Tool Being was, uh, was being published in um, 2001. I was working on my, my dissertation uh, at the time, and I remember writing the because yeah, I probably should have known about it from the, coming from the, the sort of connection between the humanities <coughs> and the computing that I was working on. And I remember writing to OpenPort, which is the publisher, because it was, it was late or it was delayed. Um, and I was like, what's going on? Like, I need this object-oriented stuff. And they're like, yeah, 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 it's, it's coming. Uh, and then yeah, and I ended up citing it in, in, in my dissertation in my first book. And Graham was in Cairo um, a couple years later. Um, and I've been, you know, doing the, the sort of Amazon ego searching that we all do but don't talk about. Where you, you, it, 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 and it digs what, into yeah, the citations. It digs into full text. Maybe it doesn't do that anymore, but it used it does. to. That does, yeah. Um, yeah, but Graham, like, wrote to me um, because I'd cited um, it's had it still being like fairly early, I guess, um, and we just started. That was how we met. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the delay wasn't my fault, by the way. I, I knew it was your fault. Way yeah. on time. Yeah, yeah it was. It was so obviously copy. their fault. Yeah. They, they made that clear in their email. So, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> and Anna, Levi, would you like to just introduce yourself a little? And uh, yeah, I think um, Levi couldn't make it to the symposium itself, but I think he knows what was in it. Right. Uh, I mean, just just to talk about uh, a little bit how we met. Um, yeah. 
I was, uh, you know, I, I have a blog, Larval Subjects, and uh, during this time period, I think it's calmed down quite a bit. It's not the same as it was. Uh, there was a, a whole constellation of uh, theory blogs that would interact uh, with one another, and uh, I was uh, beginning to hear a lot of rumblings about uh, speculative realism, and uh, at that time, I was uh, very deeply enmeshed in the, uh, the thought of uh, Deleuze. And um, so, uh, you know, I felt that Deleuze had uh, been doing this sort of work with uh, realism and uh, with uh, materialism. And so <clears throat> I wanted to put together a Deleuzean rejoinder to the speculative realists. And I, I contacted Nick Cernisek, who seemed to know a great deal about uh, speculative realism and was deeply enmeshed in these sorts of things. And uh, we, we began to contacting uh, Deleuzean scholars, and we wanted the, the speculative uh, realists involved in this as well. And uh, we, we contacted uh, Graham, uh, who was incredibly uh, generous in uh, putting this, this project together and uh, putting us in contact uh, with, uh, with other people. When, when was this? Would this Summer be? of 2008, right when I was bit by the rabid dog. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We, we brought you the, uh, the rabid realist right. uh, at, the, at the time. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, the next thing that we knew, this project became something entirely different. Uh, it wasn't uh, a Deleuzean text any longer, but uh, became, a, you know, a sort of manifesto, I guess, uh, for realist yes. and materialist uh, orientations of thought. Um, and it was out of that that uh, the speculative turn grew. And, uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, excellent. All of the controversy um, generated by these things. Let me talk a little bit about format. I guess Corey and I are going to try to like co-manage this thing. Um, so we thought for the most part we would start with conversation among us mm -hmm. and then widen, widen the gyre until by the end we're all involved. Uh, but we thought we might set the things spinning just among us. And if you don't mind, I'm going to start with a question uh, to Graham. Um, it's somewhat of a writerly question, but it, maybe it's a metaphysical question. Mm -hmm. But there was some moment when you decided that the right way to speak about the fact that we can't know any object entirely was to use the, the term withdrawn. <coughs> and it always struck me that withdrawn was a, a very decisive poetic moment because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transitive verb, it can be used passively, but there seems to be intentionality in it. And I remember the thrill I got when I first thought of the fullness of being of an object, that it withdraws mm -hmm. from us, it withdraws from itself. I naturally applied all the, all the social meanings that go with that word. And I was wondering, was there a, mo a time when you thought, well, I could just say it's hidden, or I could just say it's invisible, or I could just say it's... What, what, what's behind the term withdrawn? Where did you see that going? Well, of course, I took the term from Heidegger. Uh, I see. Zich and Zien and Itzuk all over being in time and some of his other texts. And so in a way, it's just, you know, like in Darwin's theory, animals somehow preserve their evolutionary history somewhere in their current appearance uh, or physiology. That's, that's sort of the Heideggerian remnant mm -hmm. in Triple O, which was originally just the reading of Heidegger that expanded into becoming a philosophy. Uh -huh. And so that's where withdrawal came from. I, I, every now and then I toy with dumping it for something else. The reason being, I'm actually, I'm a pragmatist when it comes to terminology. Yes. I don't worry too much about the connotations of this word to this group or this group. I just say you, you uh, posit that as your term and you let them learn from your own works what you mean by it. That's it. But with withdrawal, people sometimes have this idea or conception that there's something sitting on a table and then for some reason it withdraws. But the point, it was never on the table. It was never present in the first place. So I, I've been toying with withhold instead of withdraw. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I'm going to decide on yet. But it's, it's really a Heideggerian term that I can't take much credit for. So why do you so, think he used it? Uh, I mean, is that a term? I don't know he, German he well many. enough to know. Yeah, he used like that, that word was right there in the German dictionary. And I just, just like him plucked it. Heidegger has multiple synonyms for the same idea, which is withdrawing, veiling, concealing, sheltering. Uh -huh. harboring, all these terms that he uses to refer to the non-presence of a thing <coughs> that is nonetheless uh -huh. real. Yeah, and they're all very provocative terms. Yes. But I was, I was just saying uh, to, uh, I think, Levi outside that, uh, and Ian, um, architects are strange in that they very often don't understand the philosophies they're reading. 
but they do uh, watch the metaphors mm. and uh, tend to build them. So, you know, if it's about if it's about the fold, well, we'll we'll build folds, <laughs> and if it's about the drawing, we'll try to, like, you know, s somehow instantiate that that process. Well, Michael Speaks made an interesting claim at the conference last week. Michael Speaks, the dean of architecture at Syracuse. Uh, made the claim that it's the architects who misunderstood Derrida who got more interesting results. So he, mm -hmm. he was ripping on the Parc de la Villette and saying that Chumi understood Derrida too well. And that really <laughs> yeah. is a deconstructed <coughs> plan. Yeah. Just think it's good. Whereas Eisenman, he says, misunderstood Derrida who came up with more interesting results. Uh -huh. And so I would tell architects never to worry about misunderstanding philosophy any more than I would worry about misunderstanding <laughs> architects. You, you, when you're translating from one discipline to another, there are going to be yeah. misunderstandings. Yes. And Harold Bloom talks about how misunderstanding is the Correct. result of all right. creation of new great authors right. that are previous. Mis misreading early misreading. poets. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't see So a you problem. don't mind being misread then? Not all right, least. guys, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to be too literally understood. Yeah. I, don't want to, I just don't want people to say, oh, objects. Giant cubes. Yeah. Yeah. Minimalist would be the easy literalist misunderstanding. Yeah, or toasters. Oh, There's a toaster a, shaped, yeah. toaster shaped buildings. Oh, toaster yeah. shaped. Okay. This okay. is very refreshing. I think I can relax now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you see the difference in the object exhibition, which the cue was, can you produce an OO architecture or object, and the diversity of them is massive. Yeah, it was refreshing. Yeah. yeah. And reassuring. Yeah. I feel reassured just as Craig. <laughs> well, that was my big question. <laughs> well, well, I'll, question. question. Yeah. I'll add one thing to it, actually. Oh, yeah. The more styles that can emerge from uh, OOO, the more architectural styles that can emerge from it over time, and that, please don't be impatient. As was also said last week, yeah. it took 20 years from Derry Dye's book to the deconstructive his show at the moment. Sure. Um, for example, uh, actually Aristotle says one of the definitions he gives of substance is that it can have different qualities at different times. So white is always white, black is always black, gray is always gray, but Socrates can be happy or sad and still be Socrates. Yeah, That's what makes him a substance. Mm -hmm. And I find this too about influence, intellectual influences. So for example, when I look at a, a philosophy author, I think one of the signs of their greatness is when you find them used on both the left and the right politically. So Hegel, mm -hmm. Heidegger, <clears throat> because it shows that there's something deep there that everybody's got to deal with and it's not just a convenient support to what they believe. My worry about Badiou, for example, is it's still leftists who are reading Badiou. You're not seeing any right Badiouians yet. And although that sounds like a horrible concept, right, Badiouians, <laughs> it would at least show that there's something there that hits home for everybody. Yeah. And so until people other than hardcore Maoists and the like are mm -hmm. appreciating Badiou, I'm going to be a little suspicious. And mm -hmm. the same thing about architecture. We're seeing at least three different early triple O styles being tested in architecture schools. Mm -hmm. And we'll see, hopefully there will be more. We'll see what comes of this. OK, we're on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, adding to the Heidegger comment, um, in your book, Heidegger Explained, you talk about abbreviation. You know, Heidegger sees abbreviation as a form of degradation. Um, and you actually, I think you mentioned UT, the University I, of I Texas. Did. Yeah, I agree. Being, being, and, and um, you know, architects, and it's just a conference with Mario Carpo where he sort of describes the new uh, trend of digital technology and architecture as being a form of abbreviation and compression. So like data, you compress it into a flash drive, into a JPEG, and then architects compress information into two-dimensional drawings that are then expanded into three dimensions. I used to say that symbolism was a form of abbreviation. Yeah. And that used to be a big topic. Like, we have to have symbolism in architecture. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of just degrading, really. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And metaphor as well. But I wonder, I mean, architects, I think, are good at Metaphors generating through the loss of information. You mentioned just now the loss of information, mm -hmm. which you know comes from Bergson. I wonder if there's value in OOO in the withdrawal and using it as a generative mechanism and how that might look. Is it right. I, I hope it was clear I was not with Heidegger on that point. Yeah. In yeah, some yeah. ways, he's just an old reactionary crank, and I don't want any part of that of him, that part of him. But um, uh, I'm in favor of it because I'm all in favor of the concept of translation, that there's no yeah. relation without a, no transport without transformation, as Latour puts it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's inevitable. So I have nothing against abbreviation, symbolization, shortcuts. Well, I think my challenge with this, some, again, we were talking about this this morning, is that how other people grasp onto that. So, you know, there'll be suddenly everyone saying that Chandigarh is a bunch of elephants. Mm -hmm. And that's all they talk about. It's a bunch of elephants over and over because the image was so incredibly compelling, right? 
So then people take the abbreviations and make them into caricatures, and the caricatures then collapse everything else that supports it. That's where I think the problem is. Like the so iceberg, he has a lot of problems. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, but you talk about that. Uh, you often will say, may, maybe it's a point that's obvious, but it's always worth saying, the description of the thing is not the thing. And your little slogan said that. Right. We sat around describing things and describing things, but they're still not the thing. Mm -hmm. When we teach and review architecture, this happens all the time. We see the work, you know, thousands of, hundreds of hours for sure, on the wall, and it gets talked about it in 15 minutes or less. And there's not a student who doesn't feel sort of reduced by that. And I think this happens to architects. The, the immense amount of intelligence that goes into a building ends up uh, being a paragraph or a sentence or an image. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's not necessarily the immense amount of intellectual drive that makes a building that we're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about what, for, yeah, the, all the people that came together to make something happen, as was shown by yeah. uh, yeah, Jan, Janiva. The, yes, yeah, yeah, Janiva. Um, you know, that, that that story people should learn from because each time we make a new complex uh, endeavor, mm -hmm. we have to know, which is why I was talking to you about the game theory last night. What, what are the psychological implications of all of that and how does that affect the object itself? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like uh, after a movie, you know, you watch, you watch a movie and uh, then the credits start rolling mm -hmm. and they roll and they roll and people are walking up and still rolling and every like the, the assistants had assistants and caterers and the, like it just keeps going people are walking out and uh, there's thousands of people coordinated to make this experience Kim how'd you like it yeah pretty good <laughs> <laughs> yeah I like the part where he says you know and it's like um, <laughs> like a little bit of candy a little bit of mental candy and I've always thought if it wasn't for the economics of movies and the sales of tickets this would not imbalance between the, exp the time and expertise. Like movies, I think, are like the, the, almost the peak of what we're capable of. More, than, more so than teaching? <laughs> more so than teaching, yes. Do you know what's uh, happening right now, which is really interesting to me, is I'm working a bit with Francis Ford Coppola, and he's working on something called live cinema, which is um, it's, it's you walk into a theater and you sit down like a normal theater, but it's not a film that's projected. He builds a complex set of contraptions that move the actors and the scenes around in front of you, and they pass by in time. So you're watching living people, yet with the time sequence of a film, sometimes it goes back in time, sometimes in forward in time. Why is that not theater? I was going to ask the same yeah. thing. <laughs> it's, yeah, it because like in theater. a theater, <laughs> you have clear acts. Is there's a timing to... to, oh, to so it's more continuous. Yeah, it the never stops. Uh, right. the, the, in, a, in, a, in a movie... You can switch from that scene to that scene. This mm -hmm. moves like a, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, like that. But in a, in a, in a stage set, you kind of have to change the set, or you right. have to have a break. It's slightly different, but it, it changes your understanding of what it is that you're watching because there seems to be a realness a to it, and b the sequence of time doesn't quite make sense. And so you're trying to figure out, am I watching something real or am I watching a film? And you can't just kind of replay it every two hours, you know. It's kind of, you, you can only see it a few times. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, you brought up Schumacher, and he recently had that interesting statement where he said he's not a star architect. And the reason for it, yeah, so he did a whole article about how he refuses to be called a star architect. And the reason is because he finds himself in an assemblage with all these other people, these other actors, and... Uh, he uses the Deleuzian term of assemblage, which then you brought up the compound. Mm -hmm. And I was curious what the difference between a compound and an assemblage would be. Mm. I thought about that. Or, a, oh, oh. or a, a tiny ontology or a flat ontology. Well, I mean, the Spinoza stimmy, not, not addressing that particular question, wants to, to say, you know, we don't know what withdrawal can do. Mm -hmm. And so it, it seems to me that uh, if the withdrawal thesis is true, we would expect this sort of compression, but there's something in the work of art, whether it be architecture or a painting or a novel or something like that, that strives for eternity. And <clears throat> the measure of that eternity is its ability to generate compressions throughout time, right? To, to not cease to be talked about 
in some way or another to continue to generate speech and uh, compression in some, some form or another. So w what and do you uh, mean by compression and time then? Well, you, you were talking about the reduction of the building yeah. to just a few lines yeah. of, of speech. And, and there's this whole sort of trial, I think, that the object undergoes, right? Uh, will it be able to continue throughout time or will it exhaust yeah. itself in that reduction or that compression? Right. Will it be able to, uh, to uh, continue to generate new uh, interpretations and translations and divergences? And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I had uh, an epigraph to a talk uh, that I gave uh, once uh, that I attributed to an unknown author that said that the Epic of Gilgamesh can still be read. And the point of this was that something like the Epic of Gilgamesh or Homer's Odyssey or, or, or Dante, right, continues to travel throughout time. It continues to be able to generate, right, uh, you know, new forms of, of translation. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, there's a, a way in which a work can become exhausted and dead when it's no longer able to, to travel in these sorts of ways. And that's exactly what we would expect, right, from something like uh, like withdrawal. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to try to answer the assemblage question because I think it's important. Uh, and I'm not 100% certain about compound yet for reasons that may, yeah, became, okay. may become clear. Um, so the, the Tim Morton, who, who couldn't be here, has this, this kind of stock pat criticism of, of, of certain aspects of philosophies of becoming which he calls lava lampiness, um, and and you know there's this this sort of idea with the with the assemblage that it's it's this lava lampy smooth, tidy, um, covered over, pretty thing, you know everything is in its place and we can talk about it as kind of as kind of one you know one delightfully curved sexual shape, right? <laughs> and in fact, what you find it's like the example of the credits of the film, like there's this, there's like all these gaffers and these yeah. caterers and the electricians and you know someone had to manage the dog. And, and somehow, improbably, with all of the messiness of, of, a, of a film production, uh, yet a, a film emerged. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I kind of like to think that there's a, a move in, in Triple R to, um, to th kind of throw off that, uh, that sheet or that, that cover. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, let's, let's, see what's, let's see what's going on. And Latour does this to some extent, I mean, considerably in, in, in science studies, methodologically. But the, the network, the metaphor of the network, is also guilty of this of this same kind of sense of oh everything is, is sort of interconnected and you can follow the logic of the uh, of the graph in order to see how 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 tidy those those couplings are, um, but they're not uh, they're not uh, and you and you find that uh, in a day to day life it, this is not just a philosophical or aesthetic uh, principle you know. Uh, you're in this this Zahadi structure trying to find the toilet, and and they have to graft things onto the structure in order that the toilet become possible to perceive and use, uh, and so that's a yeah, that's a, a consequence of this uh, sort of slipperiness uh, of thinking in these mm -hmm. these uh, lava lampy terms to, to to use Tim's Tim's word for it. <laughs> uh, and so <coughs> is the claim that you're making here that there's a, a way in which the the the, the product is in excess of the assemblage out of which it emerges or is constructed. Um, they can't simply be uh, accounted for in, in terms of uh, its process of, of assembly. Well, I don't, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not taking a position on that, on, the, on the, the, the construction or the persistence over time, but, but the consequences of the, 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 the metaphor of, of you know, uh, a universe of machines coupled to one another, or a flows coupled to one another, or all of those, all of those kinds of uh, metaphorical gestures we find in these philosophies of becoming. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, to get back to compound as a sort of tested yeah. out. Yeah. On the one hand, the compound is is you know as a chemical term mm -hmm. is at least tidier. And no, 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 the, you know, there's um, uh, there, there's uh, these two or three components, mm -hmm. and you know, we are identifying them and then using this this sort of. We're holding them in our hands, mm -hmm. so they remain visible. Um, but there is a risk there too of too much synthesis, uh, the assumption of synthesis coming into play, right? But go ahead. I, I was going to say that the the reason I introduced compound the other day was partly because Albina was here, and I knew we were going to have an argument about Latour because right. we both love Latour, <laughs> but she accepts his theories more than I do. And I was trying to replace Latour's term hybrid, which is valuable for showing that nature and culture don't yeah. to put apart neatly. But Latour ends up sliding into thinking that every compound is a hybrid. So the human is always there. So Ramses II couldn't have had tuberculosis because yeah. humans didn't know about tuberculosis yet. 
So uh, in part, it's an attempt to yeah. remove humans from all compounds and say there are compounds like water that have no humans in them. And on, on the other hand, it's triple O. For triple O, coupling is a problem in a way that it's not usually for assemblage theory. So Zolanda never thinks it's a problem to right. plug things. It's actually it. the opposite. It's always coupling. Yeah. It's like happening constantly. Whereas for triple O, which links in many ways to the occasionalist tradition, making links is a problem. We need to explain how this is possible. And there's always a coupling between a real object and a sensual one, not between two real ones or two sensual ones. So it's like sticking two opposite poles of a magnet together. The, the same poles will repel. You need to link mag magnets from the opposite poles. And then it becomes a challenge to explain how that happens. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a couple of parables that I'm drawn to, and I'm sure you know of them. Um, they are uh, always fascinated me. One is the myth of, uh, what is it, Theseus's boat? Yeah, the ship, we, ship yeah where there was a, um, a military naval boat which um, was repaired over the years but every time they repaired it they took the piece off they needed to repair it, stuck it in a pile and until eventually the entire boat w was in one pile and then there was the other boat that looked like the boat um, but that actually sailed and the question was always which one is the real boat mm -hmm. um, the one that was first made or the one that's there now and both are assemblages one's maybe a compound and One's something else. I, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear what you think about. And the other parable I often think about is um, the, a tree uh, in a meadow. Um, so there's a tree in a meadow, and it's fairly easy to talk about it as a tree. And then you put two trees in a meadow, and it's still a little bit easy to talk about two trees in a meadow, three, and, until they're four or five. And at a certain point, the trees become a forest. When are we seeing the trees as a forest versus an assembly of trees? And those are like weird little parables that I'm always, mm -hmm. kind of little conundrums. Gotcha. Probably rhetorical. Yeah, no, no, I mean, you can I also. Think, oh, I think sort of the, 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 the one tree, two, three, four, <coughs> bunch forest, yeah. I, I think an ecologist would actually say if something does happen in the region between 12 and 15, Literally. Yeah, and depending 12 and on the type of tree, obviously, right. one crepe myrtle like versus one fir sudden, tree. I mean, right, I get suddenly <laughs> some insect population is capable yeah. of reproducing. <clears throat> but there are little sort of thresholds and steps. And I think, I think scientists do not think of the world as a lava lamp at all. But they're constantly looking for threshold phenomena where, you know, there are transitions. Like, oh, wow, couldn't, yeah. can. Like, this is the emergence of an object. We'll, we'll name that, that next thing. Because the continuities, there are discontinuities everywhere. And I think language and theorists are always looking for what's it like carving reality at the joints. It's like, mm -hmm. at what point has this new, this new thing deserve a name? I wonder uh, if you could yeah. relate threshold and singularity to, to the idea of articulation that you brought up. Because I think articulation is critical in terms of architecture. And I think that's the issue I agree with you with Patrick Schumacher's yeah. work is that it lacks articulation, so you need this addition of signage and so forth. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's something there. And the right. uh, architectural construction process in yeah. a linear one that begins with gravity and still exists down there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of articulation, there's hand joints and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a Renaissance Venetian painting phrase called pentimento, which means to have a second thought. And the idea is that when you paint, and you paint over it on the canvas, you should not erase completely in other words, you leave something behind. So in the conceptualization and in the construction of ideas as well as the construction of so buildings and cities, there remain not the complete withdrawal, but the ghost, the hauntingness of the secret, that it could be rendered visible, the marking of a contract on a wall for a meter or whatever. So so I, when it gets to architecture, I think the construction of an idea may be different than the construction of space over time because you can come back to that if you don't rep erase it too well. <laughs> I think it's important because the representation, that's what we deal with. You mentioned it, 90% of our buildings aren't built. They're just drawings and representations. But those are objects in as much, as much of a sense as the building. Well, if I put it in relation to the tree discussion and try and draw that parallel to architecture, or at least the need for physical um, things uh, that we occupy. Um, I would say that you know, if you put a point or something somewhere, it becomes a thing in a space. If you put two things somewhere, it creates a line connecting them, a relationship connecting them. If you place 
three things in a space, depending on your relation to those three things, it creates an area. Then you get to four things. It's a pyramidical room, a tetrahedron. And the more, you, the more things you place, the stronger you become building an, an empty, an, you, you become forming the air. And, and at some point, all of those things together created a building. So at some point, it went from being a brick to a building, or from dirt, or from a hole in the ground, which is actually what architecture is. Because anywhere you see a building, there's a giant metaphysical hole, yeah, hole in the ground, in the ground yeah. somewhere, which was where all that stuff came from <laughs> to make this thing on top of the ground. Well, I think the, I think for many of us, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, the the, the, the promise or the enticement of triple R is that we can look at where objects come into being from from their components, mm -hmm. um, like where those transition effects are for us. So between an open field and a room, at what point can we say it is? It is now. It's a room. Now it's a room. Now it gets a name. It gets a label. And one of, one, one of the questions uh, that I've yeah. struggled with as I've, as I've grappled increasingly with architecture is at, at, at what point can we say that uh, something is, is architectural? And so, you know, on the one hand, we have this issue of the difference between sculpture and architecture, right? Uh, and, and should we see these as, as two poles? But on the other hand, right, uh, is the, the enclosure the condition at which something is this sort of uh, well, folding or material, I, I, I think of it as the materialization of the void and the, the genesis of void is, yeah. is what's taking place in, uh, in architecture, which I would also call a, a spiritualization of space. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, you know, something like Stonehenge, mm -hmm. right, uh, which creates some form of, uh, of an enclosure yet, right, it's still, Open. Well, we don't right, know exactly yeah. what it, Stonehenge did, but assuming that it was a tool or a machine of some kind, as well as a place of assemblage, mm -hmm. you could potentially call it architectural. If it was a machine or a tool, uh, like, say, a, a dish in Puerto Rico to capture light from the stars, I wouldn't call that architecture, although it does the same thing that Stonehenge does. Mm -hmm. But since you're not necessarily assembling in the dish, for some kind of use. I wouldn't call it the dish architecture. That's just me, is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, if we have four <laughs> posts in That's a field, huge question that, in architecture right, schools, yeah. I can assure you. Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, of that's well, a building, but why is, is it, it so difficult? Why, I, I mean, know, it, it, it bugs us. I mean, I would have said, and I hate to really oversimplify, but uh, as you were saying earlier, sometimes it's okay. Um, we, we didn't have architecture to begin with, I don't believe, as proto-humans. We had some kind of instinctual desire to find shelter, um, much like a spider builds a web. Right. When a spider builds a web, it doesn't go to web university. It doesn't ask its uncle, what's the best way to make a web? Or I saw someone making a web over there like this, so I want to kind of improve on it. <laughs> it just makes the web. And we did the same thing. That, I don't believe, is architecture because it's an instinctual process on its own. Then from there, we started to realize that there were certain things that we were doing, perhaps because of our genetic evolution. We, we began to see that perhaps eating in the same place where we pee or poop is <laughs> probably not a good idea because some of our friends seem to be getting sick. So maybe we should separate in our web the food area from the, from the peeing area. And then you've created function. But is that really architecture? Probably not because it's purely a functional need that you're addressing. The next stage is you say, well, I eat here, that's great, and I pee over there and there's a fire here, and I wanna kind of express that relationship in some particular way that other people can enjoy, and I might have religion introduced into it and take a piece of the fire and put it on a shelf or something like that. Suddenly you've created an emotive uh, characteristic. This, I would say, reaches the realm of architecture uh, the question I would say is that after millions of years of development, is this it? Like, won't there be a time when we surpass architecture and we look back at it as, as primitive as we look back at a shelter? 
that proto-humans made, that there was that time when architecture was it, and gosh, that must have been pretty simple. Like, what's the next they, thing? They well, naturally <laughs> produced Oslo operas. Yeah, just like just, and they just had this <laughs> stupid emotive thing that they were dealing with, you know? It's like, they how couldn't primitive help is that? Those things, yeah, right. there, is there another version <laughs> that, that is coming in, you know, 20,000 or uh, 50 or 100,000 years? <laughs> I have a question for you, Craig. Does, um, you know, I see a tendency teaching a lot of digital technologies for people to be okay with ending at the representation because it's becoming so good and so easy to do that they don't have the desire to make as much as I think we used to. And it's okay to end at that level. And I, I would ask you, is like, is architecture, does it have to be made? Does it have well, to be it, built? It's worse than that because we're mm -hmm. taught not to make things yeah. in our schools. So we're taught not to use our hands or to interact directly with people. We're taught to learn alone. We're taught to we're now taught to um, just create virtual mm -hmm. things and our basic interaction with that is actually like this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the further we teach ourselves to disso disassociate with what we make, then we will continue down this road. Furthermore, as w what I believe is being said in this, in this conference, that those things we make do have it conditions that we have to be aware of, and the further we remove ourselves from those conditions, the, the more remote it's going to be. I don't believe what people are saying at this conference is to make virtual things. Right. Yeah, but I mean, you know, returning to to the issue of individuation that you brought up earlier with the ship of Theseus, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, we can complicate uh, that example even further that you <laughs> gave, where where we have two ships. Yeah. Right, and we're removing uh, that are identical structurally, yeah. and we're removing a board from one and uh, it on placing it on the other until finally the matter, right, of these two ships has completely switched. And what is the identity here? I think this is some of what you get at uh, with with your critiques of materialism that the formal dimension, right, uh, you know, plays a key role with. Uh, respect to what makes a thing a thing, right? We can't reduce it to its materialization. Every uh, you know, physical yeah. object that, ex that it, exists is, is the ship of Theseus. Our bodies are exactly. continuously producing They're, cells and yeah, so on. That's sort of what Jorge was saying. But, and so, but you know, we have common language that right? people use the term <coughs> formations. Mm -hmm. Formations yeah. of ships, formations of airplanes in mm -hmm. flight, uh, the delta, the V, the echelon. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, you can change the soldiers, you can change the boats, but you know, these are configurational objects that dissolve and come together and dissolve. And they get a name when they're set out a certain way and they, they disappear. I used the example yesterday of a, a, a laps and fists and smiles. Like, this is a fist, this isn't. What did I do? It's still made of fingers, you know? And so when you make <coughs> architects make niches, like uh, most of architecture is actually the art of arrangement. It's the art of uh, creating Curation. formations mm -hmm. of things that create like third objects. I mean, that's the magic of architecture itself, yeah. is that by the sheer act of placement, new objects come into being. Right. Well, I mean, and, and what I wanted to, to bring up in approaching the ship of Theseus example and, uh, you know, the uh, uh, substantial forms, I guess, is, is what we're talking about here, is with respect to the virtual object, right, uh, mm -hmm. which, which would be pure form, divorced of materiality, right? Is that sufficient for that to be I an would object? Say it has it's to virtuality. Be. Well, right? the, the virtual form as it's understood as a, as a computational virtual form, I mean, not as, a, as an abstracted philosophical virtual form, also has materiality, of this course. This is true, yeah. Uh, and so in, so in some ways, all of these examples suggest a kind of exercise of attention of the specificity of things, of attention to the specificity. And then in, in the fist and the, and the boat, um, and the model are all fine. Like, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the with, with computationalism as a design practice. The problem is in not not being very carefully aware of what that is that's taking place. Yeah. And in some respects, it doesn't matter what the <coughs> subject is. I, I was thinking about this as as, as we've been we've been talking. Um, uh, it, sometimes it's useful to come up with like the most absurd example possible. And the I, I Twizzlers, any of the, the Twizzlers. Twizzlers. Right. It's going to be, all of my analogies are food related, so uh, I'm a very hungry person. Are you familiar with this, this sandwich controversy about hot dogs that's been making the rounds lately? No. So there's this question, is a hot dog 
a sandwich. And if you go <laughs> onto the internet, there's burning issues. You know, many different. We have tacos over there, and you can ask the same question yeah, of right. tacos: Is a taco a sandwich? And this seems like the kind of thing. Like, why are people wasting their time? You know, when they could be could be uh, saving children in Syria, right. arguing about uh, whether a hot dog uh, is. And you know, so I have a colleague at the Atlantic who was talking about the orientation of the f of the meat related to the in relation to the bread, and because it's vertical, it's vertical right. in a in a hot dog, therefore it is not a sandwich. But if you think about the, the cafes of Paris where the sandwiches are oriented in their shelves in that mm -hmm. vertical position right. before the, like is it not a sandwich when it's in the shelf but then it's handed <laughs> to you and you exchange your, your several euros for it and then it becomes a sandwich. And, and the, these kinds of exercises are, uh, are quite useful. They're not at all useless. Uh, they, are, they are a kind of, kind of tiny design charrettes that you can conduct almost every moment of every day whether or not they, they ever make, it's not that you want to build a building that answers the question, is a hot dog a sandwich? Which is, I can kind of imagine happening, God help us, <laughs> right? Uh, but rather that the, the attention to the, 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 the specificity of any individual thing. Is an opening an arch or is an opening a window or a door? Yeah, you could have that. Yeah, we have, we have that all the time. I'd like to bring up a, a, something that about origins, the origin stories. Yeah, um, just waiting for this. <laughs> no, it's, all, it's all cool. It's all cool. Um, I do think sort of doing an archaeology of objects is, all, is interesting. It's like etymology of words, where we feel like if we know how the word was built, we have some insight into the meaning of the word. Or if there's true archaeology, we'll try to imagine life in nature or something like that. But um, there's an interesting uh, theory of the origin of language, which goes along those lines, which is since everything makes a sound, there's a sound. Uh, sounds can communicate. And presumably when animals, uh, let's say lower animals, make sounds, uh, they can communicate by the sounds. But those sounds are not language. They're just communication media, shall we say. Depends on the animal, I think. Um, the higher animals might. But the theory says, actually, language starts when you tell a lie. In other words, if you if you can use if you take command of a sound and use it to deceive, well, lots of animals do that. Some well, some do. Yeah. Um, because it's only when you when you produce a sound, let's say, that is not correct in its context, that you realize that the effect of that sound does not depend on the existence of its source, right? So, you might uh, learn how to make a sound of a much larger animal than you are. Mm -hmm. Or you might sound an alarm, like an alarm cry when there's nothing to be afraid of. Everything runs off, and then you get the food. Or right? you get a so deeper you, voice so you yeah. can acquire So a that mate. actually becomes a word. <laughs> oh, look, First that thing. means. So the referent is always absent. Otherwise, you don't have, you just have natural present. So I think this is sort of a Derridian view, that the f fundamental language is actually uh, the, dis the dislodgement of a sound from its, from its uh, source. So you might say, let's build a fire. Why should we build a fire? Because that other tribe will think we camped here. And, you know, but we'll be hanging out over here, and then we'll, we'll have them for breakfast. Um, but, like, so the building of a fire when you don't need a fire is when you start going like, okay, now I know the fire. So in, in architecture, does that mean uselessness is a value? Because I've heard that before. No, misdirection. <laughs> Yeah. Now, what I've heard, I think this is from Lacan. Levi can correct me since he's the Lacan expert at the table. Uh, he, Lacan, I think, says animals can't already do that, and then humans are the ones who can pretend to be lying when they're not. Isn't that how he formulates it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's an extra level of... Wow. Yeah, it's an extra, extra level. level. Oh, yeah, that's right. kind of freaky. Yeah. My head's yeah. starting to melt again. <laughs> Greg, you must know yeah, that about the it. SF MoMA, the original one, uh -huh. the where Boto he put one. the trees on the top. Right, yeah. And it was a deception. So he could get some other interest in the project. Oh well, these are all. They're, I mean, sort of that's you know, I, I think that's yeah. not necessarily true. He really fought hard to get those trees. I know, and but I don't think he fought unless he was doing what uh, Graham is suggesting. He was lying to make it look like he was not lying, or whatever. That, that's how the story goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. pretending so, that he's yeah. lying, but he's actually telling the yeah. truth. Yeah. So, so within but it happens in architecture. Within architecture, there's a long discourse about honesty in architecture. Mm -hmm. Like the basis of modernism was. To yeah. get rid of all deceptions oh, but that's, and indications, I like, can't believe we're going to be honest. Do a philosoph do philosophers ever believe that they're being absolutely honest? I don't know if any if that's a healthy thing. It sounds like religion to me. When you say that I know the truth and the truth will set you free, 
A lot sounds of like it, say that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like it, but a lot of people Yeah, <laughs> it scares me that because it sort of suggests that there's this overwhelming sort of feature that we can find somehow. I don't know. It's and Socrates never said it. That's what yeah. makes him great. Yeah. 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 Um, there was a, uh, a, another thing I wanted to mention, um, and that is that, and this is because I really love what I'm hearing, and I know that it's going to affect my work in a very positive way, but there are things that are troubling me. Um, and be, I mentioned Temple Grandin the, uh, the other day. Um, what I really enjoy about her work, and I, it's led me on an interesting trail, is that she talks about our reaction to objects more so than the objects themselves. She doesn't really spend much time looking at the, those things. She looks only at their consequences and how they change patterns of behavior. She's not a behavioralist. Um, although she is at a certain level because she's dealing primarily with domestic livestock. But you can extrapolate her manner of thinking into higher orders of, of uh, existence, namely humans. And so, so uh, when I work, I, I feel that, that I'm making things, and I'm not, I'm not so much trying to understand what this thing is, so much as I'm trying to understand what effects it's going to have. And, and those effects are then pushing and pulling at this thing. So, you know, if, if, I, if I'm just, just making a cup or something and I know that the, I turn this cup upside down and that it's really narrow at the top and wide at the bottom, it's going to fall over less often than if I did it the other way and made it really narrow on the bottom and really wide at the top and made the top really heavy. It's going to just fall over every time. And what does that mean? It may be perfectly necessary to make it top heavy that because you want everybody to always be there like that with the cup. So I'm not saying one way or the other is right. It's just that the process of thinking is about all of those little bits and of, of future possibilities. And, so, and so for you, that would mean, look, here's a description of objects judged solely by their effect. And that's something that troubles you. Yeah. So how would you convince Craig that the sum of the effects well, is, is still not good enough? I wouldn't say, if, if I could just say one more thing, I wouldn't say that's the only thing we think about, but it's a big part of it. And then eventually you start to say, oh, this thing that does that looks like a duck's beak or something. And then you start talking about duck's beaks for a while. I, I get mm -hmm. that part. Mm -hmm. So then, sorry. Okay. The reason you can't do it is because there's always a reservoir of unknown possibilities. The thing is more than those possibilities. Even if you added up all of its possible yeah. effects, you wouldn't no, get the thing. Like when Merleau-Ponty says, the house is not the house viewed from nowhere, but the house viewed from everywhere, you can't build a house out of views. The house is that of which the views are had. So right. even if every possible view were, were piled up, it would just be a series of views. It wouldn't be a house. You can't live in the views. I get that. Yeah. But I can't, just because I can't solve everything doesn't mean I should stop solving things. Well, it's, it's, it's a good method, and methods are generally exaggerations. Methods are generally overmining or undermining techniques that help us get at the thing. And there's, as, an, as I mentioned, all knowledge is undermining and overmining, and knowledge is important. Knowledge helps us to know a thing, mm -hmm. but knowledge doesn't exhaust the thing. It doesn't get at what the thing really is, uh -huh. which I think aesthetics does better. So where, where would you put our, if you, you've been, thank you for being in two of our buildings, and uh, one of the few people I know have actually been in the Alexandria Library, where would you put our work in the scheme of your thinking? very high. As I told you, even before I met you or knew who you were, I, I named the Oslo Opera House as the yeah. favorite building I'd been in. And actually, the Alexandria Library would have been high on the list, too. Um, Is it a triple O building? <laughs> it's my every question. Every building. Yeah. Yeah. I've never okay. looked at buildings. <laughs> the bottom line. Yeah. I've never looked at a building and said that's triple O or not triple yeah. O. I've, I've looked at some and said that is definitely an overmining building or it's an overmining right. building. Um, um, the overmining is the big problem for architecture, just like the humanities. Undermining is usually a problem in the natural sciences. And as I've mentioned a couple times, I think the one undermining example I know of architecture is Rem's Venice Biennale show, where he decomposes architecture into pieces. A useful generator of knowledge, but not useful at getting at the essence of what architecture is. He, uh, he's unable to deal with the emergent forms that have nothing to do with assembling all these pieces. Yeah. And you said you thought it was a cynical move to begin with. Yeah, I but, but I mean, the, 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 the claim's not that we shouldn't look at buildings in terms of their effects, right? right. The, the claim is that there's something about the object that is in excess of the effects yes. that it can produce. And so, you know, once again, speaking to uh, the trial of time that, you know, the work undergoes, uh, that trial of time in part is 
the unanticipated, right. the the uh, unanticipatable effects that this that's a this good thing, produce. isn't it? That you can't anticipate everything. Yeah, it seems that's, like that's, a good that's, thing that's, to that's me. That's what okay, I call but, the but, striving yeah. to eternity of the yeah. work, right? That yeah. it, that it hasn't exhausted itself in the effects that that it intended. That it's capable of continuing to produce new effects, such as in the hotel room that I'm in. Clearly, uh, you know where the, uh, the the shower is was intended to be a closet, right? But now it's become something else, right, that required a, a translations and negotiations with respect to the space. And yeah. I think this says a, says a lot about the difference between architecture and engineering. <coughs> engineering is a literal solution to a problem. And of course, here in Austin, you have an example, I think, where engineering flipped into architecture, which is the bridge, which was a civil engineering problem that became a home for bats, yeah. mm -hmm. a remarkable home for bats, yeah. with all these effects on Austin as a result. I think that's a moment where it, unanticipatable you, you, I'm sure you know the work of psychologist J.J. Gibson. Oh, yeah. So J.J. Gibson talks about uh, not functions but affordances. Right. And an affordance is something that he says belongs to the object. Right. In a very sort of realist way. Uh, things have capacities. And that different so creatures, by virtue of their motivations, are sensitive to those capacities. So for a duck, water is uh, something to swim on. For us, it's something not to walk on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and he was able to show that infants, babies, he and his wife actually, um, could see the world already from birth as affording certain actions and forbidding other sorts of actions. But he, and I'm not sure if he ever said an object then is nothing but the set of all possible yeah. affordances, or if that's a useful metaphor. I know in teaching design it is a useful metaphor, and I use it quite precisely. I say you make things a, 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 f a set of functions, which is like the program your client asks you for, is a subset of the affordances that objects will always have more ca greater capacity for use and interpretation than you will ever see in it. So yeah. your little brief is to get this and this and this done. But that the great architects were always able to make objects that both filled the function but allowed themselves to be in some way misconstrued or misused uh, or adapted. And the Corbusier was like famous for being able to make objects that were reinterpretable and sort of reusable. And I think it's because a, a, a good architect is sensitive to the, the, the affordances of things, which maybe in your terms would be the intrinsic qualities or the invisible qualities. No. Not so how would you distinguish affordances? From uh, I'm suspicious of the concept of affordances, just as I am about capacities, which has become hot in analytic philosophy these days, too, uh -huh. as well as people like the London. Because what you're saying is that the hidden aspect of a thing is simply its future effects on other things as opposed to its present effects. It's still a matter of effects. It is, and so, and it's a phenomenal for some creature. For right. Some, so right. I, I'm, I take a hard line on this. I don't think the affordance of swimming in water belongs to a duck. I think the swimming comes from the compound entity, which is the duck plus the water. Because for me, you can create new entities all the time out of combining two existing entities. I don't think there's an affordance of swimming for the duck until the duck and the water are somehow in relation. Well, that's, that's true. Okay. So yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Okay. But I'm still trying to figure out how you can avoid trying to provide something with what you make that has to look into some representation of the future. Of capacity. There's two, I think there's one thing that you bring up, ruination, which you didn't talk about, but I'm really right. curious about because it's something we can do. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And then you talk about carpentry and the, the making of things. It's like Matthew Crawford, you mentioned him, <coughs> as, a, as a way in which to invest some of the ideas of O into something. And I think that's kind okay, of so let's hear about ruination, ruination I talked about in my book on H.P. Lovecraft. And um, ruination is a way of how do you make something worse than it is. It's also the obverse, which is making something better. And so uh, I was looking in Lovecraft at ways you could ruin the prose. He's, I think he's a wonderful prose stylist. Some people think he's a, he's a purple prose stylist. I don't. I think he's magnificent most of the time. Uh, one way to ruin literary statements is to make them more literal. I think Zizek did an even better job of this than I did. Zizek talks, for example, about that Shakespeare Made Easy series in the Parallax View, where on the left is Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question. On the right is Shakespeare in plain American English. My problem now is if I should kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and obviously that, that's yeah, something what does that lost. really mean? Yeah. Something is lost, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then yeah. Zizek goes on to suggest an even funnier one, which is to do that for Holderlin, who is way yeah. too piously worshipped by Heideggerians in, right. in philosophy. And so on the left you have, but where the danger is, there too grows the saving power. And Zizek on the right was going to put, 
if you're ever in trouble, don't panic too quickly. The solution might be just around the corner. <laughs> it's a great way to paraphrase. That's ruination. And so usually in literature, uh, overly literalizing something is, to, is the ruination. And I, I had this experience at the Venice Biennale. I was at the, um, in the Art Biennale. Mm -hmm. I was at the Irish Pavilion, which is in a different place. And this famous Irish sculptor had made this weird set of tottering cubes that were precariously balanced in a pyramid shape. And someone asked him, what inspired you to do this? And he said it was the fragile state of the Irish economy. And I thought, OK, this is how you can ruin the sculpture. You can put a tattered Irish flag on the top. But, you know, <laughs> so you're, you're doing something to undermine the aesthetic quality of it. Or so you put it. a dress yeah. on the Frank Gehry building. So oh, yeah, oh, I right. see, I see. Then it's Fred and Ginger, so we're going to yeah. put a dress on it. Well, uh, I mean, here's, here's the problem I have with that explanation, which is taken maybe too literally. Mm -hmm. It pretty much forbids all art criticism. Or, sorry, it forbids explanation. Okay. Right? So take something like, um, uh, who did this, 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 the bicycle wheel on a stool? Duchamp. Duchamp, Duchamp right. Uh, so you could go, wow, let's try to explain that. How can you explain that without being accused of like reducing it in some way? I think it already reduces itself. I think Duchamp's already a literalist. Yeah. Yeah. That's his point. Yeah, he is. And so I don't think that problem arises in his case. And I don't, I don't think the job of the art critic or the architecture critic is to explain. That's the yeah. job of the scientist. I think the, the, mm -hmm. it's the opposite. It's kind of an aesthetic task in its own right to do that kind of critique. Mm -hmm. And we talk, I talked yesterday about Dennett r ruining wine criticism by reducing the wine to its chemical formula. Sure. And this is what critique in the usual sense always does. It ruins the object by reducing it to its pieces or its effects. And the real critic gets at something that's neither of those. I think a critic is, my personal definition of a good critic is one who is able to educate larger groups of people to better understand something. And it won't not be to like, take away from it. And it takes away when they say, oh, his building is a, an iceberg. That takes away. It's overly yeah. literalizing what it looks like. Yeah. But the, the exercise of, of ruination and other is to start to start from that, that, that parodic, almost parodic uh, extreme, mm -hmm. and then from there you can kind of look back, and there's this, 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 this view from which you can then recuperate. So if you start, oh, it looks like an iceberg um, as a starting point, then that's fine. It's, it's, it's concluding there. That, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, yeah, well, you know, that's true. I mean, I personally, when we finish something, it, there's always a slew of metaphors thrown at them, and I'm always kind of happy that people like to look at the things and see different things in them. I'm very happy for that. And so people that, are happy about it. Yeah, that. and that doesn't yeah. bother me in the slightest. What bothers me is when there are those that are meant to be trying to do things like a critic, yeah, yeah, yeah. more than just a, a tourist or something, um, that they're doing that at the same time. That's where the, I think the problem is. And in, in architectural journalism, uh, there tends to be, I think, these days a lot of focus on, not enough focus on, and, and I get your point about what, um, oh God, I keep forgetting her name, Yaniva? Yani, Yani, Albina, 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 yeah. Uh, she, she um, you know, I get that that doesn't make architecture, but gosh, the story is super important. Yeah. And if people fail to recognize the value of that story, we will just keep digging deeper and deeper holes into how we make complex objects as a society. Yes, but is, is that technique valuable for telling the story, or is it actually valuable for design? I'm not sure that it's valuable for design. I don't think you could have a Latourian design, really, unless I, you no, network different pieces. I would have said that people that I know, architects or students especially, who think that somehow you have this red wine bottle in front of you and you come up with this elephant metaphor and it moves and becomes this grand thing that everyone says, isn't it great, is the wrong way of understanding building. Having red wine is partly it and having a catharsis is partly it, but you have to deal with vast amounts of people that some of them have considerably more power than you, I would say most. And how do you negotiate that to get this object mm -hmm. that has all of these embedded characteristics into something that it not only is real, but fulfills many of the things that you wanted it to fulfill when you started the, the process or developed along the way. And that's what her, I think treatise is about. And if you're trying to understand how to build and you don't at least have a feeling for that, it's like being a doctor and not knowing that you're actually working on a human patient. So, and that's, of course, I think a similar parallel. There are some doctors who see the patient as a kind of scientific exercise 
and there are others that see them as a psychological challenge Im embedded in a scientific exercise. <laughs> so there, you know, I remember when I was younger and I hurt my finger really badly in f sports injury and the doctor just said, well, you can't use that for the rest of your life. Stop thinking about sports. And I was like, well, God, really? You know, and then he walked out of the room. <laughs> he was right, right? But geez, <laughs> is that really, <laughs> you know, so architecture has, it has that need to, to deal with psychology. I wouldn't de deny that, but what I always think of when I think of Latour in architecture is that architecture is a deeply counterfactual field, and counterfactuals are a big weakness of Latour's philosophy. What did you explain? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, because for Latour, a thing is just what it does. It's not more than that. And if you look at A&T analyses, they're always about things that have already happened. Pasteur did this in the 1800s, and here's how it happened politically. He assembled these coalitions and did this and that. Or even Albina's wonderful study of Ram's office, it's about her two years that have already happened and how the project failed. <laughs> you can't really ask the kinds of questions that historians sometimes ask, which is, what if Hitler had chosen not to go after Stalingrad, but after the Caucasian oil fields? Would he have had better success? Could what he if he'd gotten into architecture school? <laughs> architecture school. Yeah. yeah. Arch yeah he was an amateur architect. architect. Yeah. I thought it was never architect. invent, yeah. never allow an architect to run for office. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and counterfactuals are important in many different fields, and they're very triple O in flavor because you're talking about not what a thing has been doing or is doing now, mm -hmm. but about not just what it might do in the future, but that's mm -hmm. one of the things. And yeah. I think Latour's I theory has a very hard time with that. It's, okay. it's more of a backwards looking. Yeah, that's so true. But, but, but explain counterfactual, the counterfactual point. That's so counterfactual. Count counterfactual yeah. is when hi history is the most well developed example. It's when you, when you look at a yeah. historical event and try to change uh, one of the things that happened. And it's often yeah. accused of <clears throat> partaking of the great man theory of history because it usually involves one great individual doing something differently, yeah. like Napoleon deciding to go this way instead of that. I don't think it needs to be yeah, that but way. I, you, you could I, imagine the economy I having different most conditions. People, so how do you see architecture like deeply involved in counterfeit? Oh, because you're looking at a space and you're looking at a design yeah. brief and imagining all kinds of different things that could. I agree with you that you can't create a model. There's no model, and I'm absolutely against models. I always say every time you make a model, there's someone will break it. That's the okay. beauty of being human. Yes. And uh, if if it weren't that way, we would have figured the model out already. But, but on the other hand, there are patterns. You mean template or model. A model, like let's say a kitchen. Okay, I know that this kitchen really works well, and therefore every kitchen should be exactly uh, like this one. A model kitchen. kitchen. A, 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 a model yeah. behavior uh, even yeah, is yeah, the yeah, same. Yeah, like okay. old people do this, and therefore if we just do this, this, and this, will it be perfect? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it'll work maybe 80% of the time. But there's always going to be 20% of the people that fall outside of that model of behavior. But there are patterns. So if you go into a party, and every party you go up to. I don't know, you walk up to somebody and you just immediately start talking and never let them talk, you'll find that they tend to kind of shy away from you. Or if you say mean or rude things, like I think your hair looks stupid, the first thing you say, mm -hmm. those people are immediately going to build up some kind, not everybody. There's going to be 10% of the people that are going to say, really, it looks stupid? Oh, that's interesting. You know, <laughs> but some people are going to just walk away. So you, you do learn some patterns from the past. You may not solve anything. But you can carry that knowledge with you and see, using your professional judgment, whether there's value in it or not. I'm not saying we can't learn from the past. I'm saying that uh, actor network theory has a hard time projecting any futures. That's right. It, it looks back and explains the exactly. past by looking at the actors. Exactly. And it, it tends to think that Pasteur is what he did. And so you can't really imagine another Pasteur than, than the guy right. who did those things. Because you've got him surrounded in but, some sense. Yeah. By but the good thing things. is that it doesn't predict any future, for me anyway. Because if it did, then it would say there's a model here. And if you follow the 2012 no. Olympics, then yeah, could you can do anything. And that's, like, that's not going to happen. Trump? Well, I don't know. But I'm not, I'm not saying you should predict <laughs> the future. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying that you should be able to project possible futures that differ from what has already happened. Yeah. And designers do this all the time, right? Yeah, designers do, imagine, yeah. what if we had a world where there were no drivers and cars? Yeah, yeah. Let's make it a reality. And I know uh, Ian has said before that Steve Jobs took this to a fascist extent because he just decided, okay, you don't need uh, disk drives on your computer anymore. And that felt premature when it happened with the iMac. Mm -hmm. and I thought, well, I'm not ready for this. I want, and I went out and bought the iNation drive, which <laughs> didn't really work that well. But this is what designers do, right? They're counterfactual. Well, there's some things. I mean, you're not going to go into a project and say, I think I can get the toilet to be on the ceiling this time. Of course not. Um, but there are other things like future of cars, driverless cars that you could explore. On a smaller scale, it would be the argument for parametricism. Because actually, ruination would be, you could say, a form of choosing. And in parametric architecture, you have virtual choices at all times, and you're just changing those choices and they have an effect. That's where you would disagree, I think. But um, in a way, you're always dealing with counterfactual. 
in the design process. If you have this parametric model, it has what these if, what if, what many if, potentials, what if. different options. Yes, but I think he escapes the hard choices by turning everything into a continuum. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. The articulation, that's the problem. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to direct a question to Levi. Um, two terms, the parliament of things and the democracy of objects. Right? One is matures, one is yours. Could you just say something about the difference, if there is a difference, and, and what it would mean for architects to, to sort of I mean, if objects have power in a political sense, or if there's any leveling to be done that, that moves from an ontological leveling to a political leveling, what do you see as the implications for designers, architects, so forth? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and, and so I don't, I don't know that I have much to say about the, uh -huh. I actually take the democracy of objects uh -huh. from Latour. Um, oh, I it, see. It was a I term that, uh, was he, uh, he also uses that term as well, uh, that he uh, somewhere uh, uses. But I mean, the, the democracy of objects, that, uh, that concept or that title is, uh, is an ontological concept, not a, uh, a political concept. And so it's not the suggestion that uh, we uh, should, should treat all objects equally or, um, you know, this was a claim that very... Mm -hmm. What does the ontological mean? Uh, uh, ontologically, that's, that's uh, yeah, yeah, it's the, uh, word, right? the, the claim that, that no object exists less than uh, another object. And okay. so it, uh, Ian, you had a nice turn of phrase for this sort of flat ontology at this point. Uh, I did. All, I don't remember what it was. Everything equally all, exists, but not everything exists equally. Yeah, yeah, thanks right. for remembering yeah. that and one. So yeah. <laughs> in, in ontocartography, um, you know, one of, one of the things that I'm interested is uh, is, is mapping fields of, of objects and their, their relations to one another, and I distinguish between a variety of different types of objects uh, in terms of uh, the functions that they're serving with respect to one another. I, I, I say that, uh, I'm trying to remember the distinctions that I draw here, and so there are what I call uh, bright objects, which uh, in a sense over-determine uh, situations or, or worlds. Uh, you know, the sun is a, a bright object in our solar system not because it radiates light, but because it uh, is what structures the gravity uh, in the, the trajectories of all the other planets. And so then you're going to have uh, satellites right, that are caught in the, uh, the orbit of, uh, of another object. And so increasingly, um, you know, something like, uh, say, the, the smartphone um, is a bright object in the, uh, the assemblages that we live in in first world countries. It's something that uh, you, you can't function in our social world uh, <coughs> without uh, this sort of device. Uh, and uh, it, it's changed the nature of the workspace, for example, right? Uh, in, in the sense that now we're expected to be available 24 hours a day to, uh, to our colleagues and to other people. They can be in a constant state of contact. And so there's no, uh, you know, there's a, an increasing breakdown of the, uh, the private and the public sector in our lives as a result of these sorts of technologies. And so we've become satellites, right, of, uh, of uh, smart objects. There are dim objects that exist in a situation, yeah. right, uh, but that um, <coughs> only very faintly appear and uh, exercise effects. Uh, the objects that really terrify me are the black holes, right, uh, which would be something like, say, cancer, from which uh, we can't escape. There's no escape velocity from this, perhaps, uh, you know, capitalism is, uh, is a black hole that's uh, structuring everything in our situation, um, or, or climate change and being able to address it. Is this something that we are able to globally address in the current circumstances that we live in? And then I'd say, I suggest that there are dark objects. These are objects that are there, but that are so thoroughly withdrawn uh, that uh, they don't appear in the situation at all. But if they were perturbed in the right way, they might suddenly explode into the, uh, the you're, situation. You're getting me worried. Yeah. 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 Uh, there are the... Let's just make America great again. Right. There are the, <laughs> there are the rogue <laughs> objects as well. The rogue objects are, are yeah. ones that uh, are like rogue planets or rogue black holes. They're, they're things that suddenly erupt in a situation, changing the configuration of the relationships between... Uh, between these objects. And so, you know, the, the, the point that I make here, right, uh, is all of these objects exist equally, right? But certainly there's quite a difference between, <clears throat> between a bright object and, uh, you know, a satellite in, 
terms of the, uh, the power and influence that they're exercising in the situation. Right, My so hope with the idea of uh, ontocartography was that through effective mapping, right, of uh, you know, the, these uh, geographies of, of objects and their relationships, we might be able to devise strategies for modifying situations and transforming the sorts of relationships that uh, are possible. This is certainly something that I see in the case of design where I, I, you know, one of my discontents with uh, contemporary political theory is that it seems to pitch everything at the discursive level. If we just change what people believe, all right, we'll change the configuration of situations or of worlds. Um, but there's also the entire material level, right? Uh, there's, there's a way in which buildings modify our behavior or technologies modify our behavior or paths and so on, yeah. I just right. wa wanted to mention something real quick. Um, uh, it actually sort of fell in line uh, with what something you said earlier. So I was fortunate enough to work with our current president on the presidential library. And actually, he's the, um, in, in this sense, regarding architecture, he's the anti-Hitler because he also wanted to be an architect. He told me that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he said that he had studied and wanted to be a, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, yeah, practicing right. architect. And he, he went off on grassroots things. Anyway, in our discussions, he said to me, asked me, is there such a thing as a democratic architecture or democratic space? And Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right? And, and, uh, and so he, I said yes, of course, and he said, well, what, uh, what does that mean? And so the only thing I could relay was a story that happened to me when I was very young. I lived in Washington, D.C. when I was 10, which was during the civil rights movements and everything like that back in the 60s and early 70s. And uh, I got a trip to the Capitol building. They used to take the school kids there. And uh, at that time, anyway, uh, you could stand under the dome of the Capitol, and right under the middle of the dome is a little 18-inch, roughly, diameter brass plaque that has nothing written on it, and it's just there in the floor. And I remembered that, and I stood on it, and I looked up, and you're dead center on the dome, so you hear all the acoustic stuff. And then you realize that where you're standing, which is in the center of everything, with Congress and the Senate on one side, the Supreme Court immediately behind you, the White House and the Washington Monument in the distance, you're in the center of power, like dead center in the power structure of the country, and you're 10 years old, and nobody else can stand there until you move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Craig, that explains so much of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, while I was there, I felt a part of democracy because I could be there physically and, and, uh, and that other people could go there. And the terrible tragedy was that after 30 or 40 or 50 years, whatever it was, I went back to the Capitol to go relive that experience as I was, just before I went to meet the president. And, uh, and I went there and the goddamn thing was cordoned off. Uh, and it was made into a, a yeah. walkway for senators, and their, their, their excuse was senators need a clear path through the dome. And I thought, this has just like ripped the dem democratic character out of our, and, it's, and, and it tells you, you what know, sort of government we have to. And, and, and <laughs> Cabusier, right, you know, he famously said the house is a machine or the home is a machine. And, and I don't think um, that architecture simply folds space or folds the void creating these sorts of spaces, but I think it also folds movements yeah. within it. But was my, it, is it the space or is it the building or what that makes the de democratic? Well, I'd like to well, well I mean, what I, was, what I was trying to get at was that uh, you know, when my wife and I were, were looking for homes a couple of years ago, uh, you know, we, we had our heart set on a uh, you know, mid-century modern sort of house. And, and one of the things that I found really striking as we looked at, at, at these homes was how non-democratic these spaces were, right? I mean, there was, there was a, a creation of pathways. There was uh, you know, an architecture that was designed to, to segregate members of the family by activities and by gender and uh, you know, by roles and functions. And so the kitchens, for example, were, were set off behind doors and you know, there was the sort of private you know, study area for, for clearly the man of the house and so on and uh, you know, uh, non-relationships with children. And so there are non-democratic forms of, of architecture. It seems to me a, a, a democratic form of architecture would be one that uh, encourages certain forms of, of, of relation and activity between people that, that don't segregate in these sorts of ways. And I, I, uh, and, you know, the democracy might be related to the articulation, to use that word again, of in one house. One has many places rather than a singular large great room. But how does this uh, fit so into yeah. triple O? Stand in the yeah. center, but you can then walk to the east and the west and around, and you realize a democratic thing respects the articulation of different uses. 
uh, people who are assembled by the enclosure of the circle, mm -hmm. but at each location, as some could say, democracy is always this one large room altogether. Yeah, I think the, the, the danger is, if, on that argument, is you very soon say that one large room is the solution to everything, oh, yeah, since right. it forbids no communications. Yeah, uh, and it's it, it, so that in, can't be you know in the master right, suites, yeah. right? We but, we saw this kind of architecture that seemed to have hints of that idea right. in the marital yeah. couple, right? Uh, where the uh, the ensuite bathrooms, right, mm -hmm. didn't have doors to them, or they had saloon doors. You know, that's sharing a little bit too much, perhaps. Right. So, uh, <laughs> you're right. Uh, but um, yeah. for me, the promise of a term like the democracy of objects or the Parliament of Things is that, and I think there's an inherently political message to it. I think the choice of those two words is not innocent. Mm. Uh, yeah that there is something one is saying with that, which is that, that ob objects, both easy to identify and harder to identify, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, have uh, agency. And as, as agents, even though they don't have social security numbers and don't have the vote, there are, there are powers that they have. So for something is, and I'm, I'm sure if Jorge was here, he'd mm -hmm. say, yes, the preservation movement says that certain buildings have rights. They have the right not to be demolished, tampered with, or changed. Uh, they are protected. Uh, a lot of cities have ordinances about old trees, <coughs> uh, including this city. Trees beyond a certain size, you have to have permission to cut them down. That's far from voting, like they, they don't go to the polls, but it is saying, hey, there are some, some things whose presence uh, we value, and you know maybe whose essence is beyond understanding, but it's, it's respect for that this thing is more than its purposes, it's more than its effects. There is something there that uh, we give respect to and rights to. And so the idea of a flat ontology for me, it can never be totally flat, like you can't have a flat organization with no CEO and no coffee person. Sure. Um, but it's a tendency, it's a saying, hey, the democratic instinct is to, uh, to uh, give rights and give endowment and give voice, which always took, took Latour to be saying, mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, with the proviso, but it seems like the motivation for it is because we actually don't fully understand the being of things, and that certain of them seem to deserve more respect than others. And I like to think that architects are in the business of making things that naturally um, There's a little uh, call, call have rights. There's a little park in Portland, Oregon. Yes. It's about this big, and it's in the middle of a six-lane road, and mm -hmm. it's a state-operated, fully protected mm -hmm. state park. <laughs> and it's literally about right. this big. Mm -hmm. And you can go there and stand on the side of the road, and there's a little sign that says out there, it's the Neil Mary Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. But you can't go over, and it's you'll get hit if you try and go use <laughs> it. <laughs> But to somebody, it was considered enough to protect. Right. I was always astonished by how that fits into this notion of objects have value. Well, the well we have to be careful, though. Because the, you know, the, the, I mean, you, all of this is true, and I, I yeah. buy it. But at the same time, when we, when we muster these kind of arguments, even in the, the planning or the architectural process, usually what we mean to do is say, well, these things have rights insofar as they facilitate the rights that I have. I want to preserve mm. trees in order that I can have a nice canopy in my neighborhood mm -hmm. rather than condos. Mm. Actually, in Austin, we have a, a, a tree ordinance that, and I was I was instrumental in uh, in um, sort of doing the, the a tree a tree of the year award here in Austin. All right. Yeah. And we went around judging trees yeah. um, and giving them awards. There are lots of trees around Austin that now have plaques on yeah. them that say the and the mayor would come and we'd like toast the tree. Right. Um, Hopefully you didn't kill the tree by nailing the <laughs> <back> to <it. laughs> No, but, but when it came, to, came time for speechifying, I was the one who did some of the speeches. And it was always in terms of the greatness of the tree, like the, the tree qua tree, not for the shade it gives or the firewood it could someday yeah. provide and so forth. Yeah. But for the, for the, the life of that tree. And I always thought if you, can, if you can say hello to a tree, like if you can greet a tree, this is the IU argument, like then, they, then you're acknowledging something beyond the effects and uses and purposes of the tree. Well, why is one tree that's better the beginning. than another? Well, it's hard, especially when you got to the top 10. Yeah. There was you're, a, you're by the way, there, there was yeah. a tree in this little park in Portland. It's about uh -huh. this tall. Uh -huh. It's cool. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> what criteria like trees. Um, are you using? Magnificence of form or heights or what? We actually had four. Uh -huh. 
Um, and one of them was the tree's uh, presence, its um, courage. Like we actually gave, we gave credit to trees that were flourishing in difficult circumstances. Oh. Mm. So great oaks in parking lots were, wow. were like favorite yeah, that's nice. because that's not what's good for the tree, but the tree was somehow resisting. Um, it's biological health, which was judged by a forestry. There were like five of us on the team. Oh. Um, yeah, so. But, yeah, I mean, it that. seems to me that part of, part of these things as well, the sort of criteria that we might use, and, and I, I always feel uncomfortable with this argument because on the one hand, I entirely agree with you. On the other yeah. hand, it strikes me as still correlationist because mm. we're the ones giving these values and so on. But yeah. it seems to me that. No, I don't uh, think we're giving it. I think we're recognizing it. And that, and that that's if an you read my language, in that it was it was recognition, it was a Bubarian recognition yeah. of the otherness of the tree. Right, and you know, uh, part of it might be yeah. its inexchangeability and singularity. What yeah. happened a few years ago, I, is it Goblin National Park? Is that what that, uh, I believe it's uh, some place in, in Utah that has all of these extraordinary- Oh, the aspen trees that are uh, like- No, they're rock formations, oh. and there were two drunken well, someone knocked men it over, uh, yeah. that, that pushed, pushed over one of them oh, over, yeah. and- and you know they were unable to to recognize that inexchangeability and that singularity for them. It was mm -hmm. you know just a you know an exercise in, in pushing thing. this thing yeah. over. But this is mm -hmm. something that only exists one right. place on the planet that that took you know tens of thousands right. of years, millions of years to to produce. Yeah, I have a sense a lot of uh, deep in, deep ecologists and deep environmentalists actually understand or have this feeling about trees. But in a in an IET world or in the instrumental world, it's hard to articulate them. Right. And, and part uh, of my little job is, I think is, you know, with others of course, is to try to keep alive the sense of uh, the being of other things, which is one of the things that attracts me so much to uh, Triple M. I, you know, we're half an hour out, and I would like to start to broaden the circle a little bit. If there, is there anyone at the table or around the room that would like to ask a question or say something? I'll start with my dear wife. Hey. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, the, the trees, the uh, being captured in the tree, there are some things <laughs> in my mind about the tree and the dignity of the tree. And I'm really thinking, you just talked about it, Bill Sight with the Wilson literature class and mm. the tree, of course. And I want to ask the philosophers here, but they're also the essays. Is there a triple O reason that, that Lopez has that peeks out of the park? Oh, yeah. That is that true? I, I think. Or do you, do you think he's just having an existential crisis independent of? of Lopez maybe or? maybe we should, for the non philosophers, yeah, just, just briefly tell yeah, the story. There's a, a historian, a grad student, who's been writing this very detailed history of a certain girl, Martine. And <laughs> yeah, we, they, we all know about that. Yeah. So, Burnett, um, he couldn't understand his face, and he tried to understand the relationship to it. And then the big moment in the book is uh, the, the gnarled roots of a chestnut tree. Um, they can change his life. He stops writing and decides everything has to change after that. And his conclusion was, live, I must live or tell. It's a Junction. It cannot be. It cannot be uh, reconciled. Being and language, yeah. which has never been that good at being. Is, the, really is there a triple O perspective? Is that a story that that? matters to you? Well, Levi was about to say yes. I was about to say no. So oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. yeah, because I mean, I think what's so so interesting about his experience in this novel, right, is he's, he's been... Uh, going throughout the world, right, and it's overwritten by language, by signifiers, it's a world that's pervaded by meaning and everything, it's a very human world, and so what he encounters in these moments, not only with respect to the tree and other things, but with respect to the flesh of his own body, not used in a really sense, but 
the sheer materiality of our body is that excess of withdrawal, right? Uh, the way in which uh, the way in which um, the things of the world can't be, uh, you know, reduced to their meaningfulness or their signification. So this is sort of radical alterity, right? That's that's at the heart of things, which I would see as very much an encounter with uh, with withdra- with with withdrawal. But you disagree. Um, yeah, because I, I think there's there's something living and something dead in existentialism. I think what's living in existentialism is its development of Kierkegaard's idea of truth as a choice, and you see this in Bad you as well, in terms mm-hmm. of the wager, wagering on a truth. Right, right, right. What I don't like about existentialism is this poor, alienated subject in a world of objects, and that's how I read the chestnut tree and the vomiting, and I don't actually think there is such a thing as nothingness. That's the part I don't like about Heidegger either. Uh-huh. I think there's yeah. nowhere you can stand where you're transcending and as against the background of nothingness. I think there's all, you're always standing somewhere, you're always part of an object and interacting with objects. And so for me, that it, it's, a, it's a nice novella, but I don't, it doesn't resonate with me personally. If I were to relate it to OOD through um, like the articulation of our environment, it's mm-hmm. almost predominantly things that we don't know about ourselves. So like ADA ramps, steps, you know, signage, different conditions that we are so unknowing of our own bodies that we need these articulations mm-hmm. in order to navigate our environment. And so in a way, that's the, the sense of nausea, that we don't know our own hands, we don't know our own bodies, and so we have to create devices in our field or an environment that allow us to navigate it. This notion of nothingness has bothered me for a long time. I used to have a good friend who was an anthropologist slash philosopher, and we got into this big argument about nothingness. And, and I agree that there is very likely no such thing as nothingness. It seems an impossibility. Um, On the other hand, I'm not a a religious person, and and my belief in the bigger thing out there would probably be the opposite of what most people think of when they think of God or a larger entity that contains everything. My idea that is somehow not explainable or the belief that holds me to everything is that there is this unapproachable nothingness. So I go the other way. Like, if there is a God, there's it's nothing. <laughs> it's not everything, because I can get everything. Everything's here already. I'm part of everything. But I can't be part of nothing. So um, I sometimes say, and my argument to my friend was, I get it. There's no such thing as nothing, but it's something I strive for. It is my belief or faith. It's the only faith I have, that there is a nothing. And I just will never get to it. So I try to close my mind off as much as I can, which might be the existentialist thing, to see how close I can get to nothing and then work my way back. And then you keep re- reintroducing yourself to all those things that you thought this is, you knew. This is the cliff. Yeah, the cliff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say go yeah. to the edge and look how far down you have to fall and fall. Uh-huh. And there's one perspective where you don't fall. You just go to the edge of the cliff and you look down and you uh, and barf. And puke, <laughs> which is the, the yeah. And the other is you get to the edge of the cliff and you jump off. Yeah. It's like two very different ways of seeing Yeah, things. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you put it in very <coughs> profound terms, and I, I think I put it in, I, I think about the nothing in much more facile terms, that we perpetually suffer from the nothing. Uh, you know, my bank account can be empty. And, uh, you know, I live in worry of the emptiness of my bank account, or as, as somebody is, uh, you know, pursuing... Uh, pursuing a degree or writing a book or something like that, it's not yet complete. And so there's nothingness that's embodied in, in this process. And uh, it seems to me that, that much of the structure of, uh, of our experience is impossible without this nothingness yeah. that uh, allows us lot. to, uh, to, to see beyond the It's uh, haunting the because you know it's not, you know, I guess, no, you know, maybe you know that it doesn't exist. It's sort of, it's a natural feeling to know that nothingness doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. I think it makes it worse in a way. Weren't there huge theological debates there about was, zero once, yeah, once it zero was introduced and, and it was zero. seen as what does heretical? It mean to say, can you use the word exist with the word nothingness yeah. in grammatically? And but they, I think these are intuitions, these are aesthetic intuitions. Well, there are vacuums, we yeah. know that. That does exist yeah. in space where there's no chemical trace in anything. Yeah, but there's an Well, they're not even sure about that. Yeah. They're Is it, I didn't see anyone's hand here because my head's facing this. Yeah, one over here. So my question is mostly for Graham. Um, do you ever feel sort of like a Sufi mystic for <laughs> philosophers clothes? It seems like we're talking about mystery here. Um, and I'm just sort of oh. curious. The pro- 
problem with, with mysticism, and the reason I don't identify with it, is because mysticism is just another form of direct access to reality. <laughs> it just uses different means than natural science claims to use or mathematics claims to use. So I'm always suspicious, uh, not just of cognitive ways of getting direct access to reality, but also of non-cognitive ways. I mean, I respect the Sufis a lot, and I love Rumi's poetry, but uh, mysticism has never seemed to me like the answer. It's just another way of trying to do what science is doing by other means. Mm. Would Sheldrake be a mysticist? Um, well, Sheldrake, of course, for those who don't know, is the guy who talks about morphogenetic fields, and so that if one bird learns how to do something, enough birds learn how to do something, all the other birds will automatically learn how to do it. So, uh, it's, it's an appealing idea, <laughs> just as a, con a counter to rampant rationalism that we yeah. deal with. But he, I think they didn't, he, he, somebody challenged him to ex an experiment. I don't know if it was Dawkins or one of those people challenged him to an experiment, and it turned out the theory failed, and yeah. Sheldrake wouldn't give it up. And I don't have too much sympathy for not being willing to modify the theory in the face of evidence. Yeah. But I, it, was a, it was a pleasurable idea to read about. Yeah, yeah it's it, a great idea. Yeah, yeah. he did the White Cat's paint, for those who don't know. Yeah. So, Is Evan, does that begin to answer? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm a fiction writer, not an architect um, or a philosopher, nor am I an archaeologist, and I wanted to bring archaeology in for a second. Um, when y'all were talking about um, things that strive for eternity, I was also thinking about when we strive to provide things with eternity, with, <laughs> which is the preservationist move. Uh, or impulse. And I've been thinking lately about um, Chinese uh, oracle bones, and they were kind of the ultimate counterfactual or fear of the counterfactual, um, trying to access divination. Um, and when they were unearthed, um, you know, they were the earliest record of Chinese writing, and then unearthed um, in the 1890s and mm -hmm. early 20th century. Um, and are kind of now looked at, you know, when they were originally written, it was for a kind of um, warring tribes to figure out how they could um, stay in place. And now they're also used um, by, in a kind of nationalist impulse to kind of um, as, assert a Chinese-ness that's, that's always been there. Um, and just, uh, I... Yeah, I mean, <coughs> throwing all of those <laughs> things out there at once, if there's anything that you'd want to pick up on. But I think of... You want um, us to focus on the bones? The, the, the bones and sort of, yeah, things that strive for eternity versus the interpretation we put on them to ensure our own eternity, whether it's um, a kind of government or a people. Politicizing um, the objects, maybe, I should. Well, it's the, sort of the divination. It's, is, is, there, is there access through any kind of material evidence, like you know, tea leaves? And, I mean, it's that sort of belief that things are connected behind the scenes. Like, so yeah. when you talk about essential objects and physical objects, that there are sort of like back channels, it seems, for you. Am I wrong? Well, There's sort of back channels between objects whose sensual qualities we get, but whose material or other sensual connections between each other we may or may not sort of get, right? Yes, but I also think philosophy has a right to talk about those, whereas since Kant, the tendency was to say science deals with object-object relations. Yeah. We deal with mm. human world relations only. Right. Mm. Right. Sciences are already succeeding at this. Mm. I would say no. I'd say that, that <coughs> yes, the natural sciences succeed in a kind of mathematical formalization of what goes on in nature. Mm -hmm. It's the most important thing that happened in human history, perhaps, mathematical physics. But um, there's still a philosophical way to talk about those interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wonder. But I guess the question is saying, from this perspective, do we have any more time for uh, divination processes? Or which would be a little bit like uh, spore tracking or going, yeah, the future has arrived. What did Gibson, William Gibson, the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Yeah. Um, like, if, if you read correctly, you can actually reconstruct an approaching object. You can, you can hear the train, you, you can see its light. No one can see the train, but if you look at the right sorts of objects in the right way, you can hear the approach of a, like a Morton-esque larger object or something. Hyper-object. Hyper-object. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Sorry, yeah. that's the word. Yeah. Yeah. 
Do you have more okay. time there for the divination or the well, I mean, of archaeology I, I, or I think the whole idea of like signs of yeah. uh, hidden things? I, I, I think it's important to distinguish between how you know people who practice divination understand what's going on and what is going on in yes. divination. And so I, you know, I see something in you know the process of throwing the bones or the speech of the oracle at Delphi or a psychoanalytic interpretation, I see a great deal of similarities here. All of these have a dimension of the aleatory as well as uh, the oracular. And in the case of a psychoanalytic interpretation, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't tell the analysand or the, uh, the patient the meaning of their symptom, it's actually a form of an act. And the oracular nature of the interpretation requires interpretation on the part of the analysand where they're actually creating the meaning of the symptom rather than being told the meaning of the, uh, the symptom in much the same way that when Socrates is told that he's the, uh, you know, the wisest man in, in all of Athens, right, um, he has to create a meaning for this enigmatic thing that's come from from the gods. And so I, I see divination more as something like a productive machine on the part of those who are you know, participating in this process. It creates a little bit of chaos that allows for the invention of something else in their life rather than telling them what the future already was. Well, uh, I, I see, I'm going to put in something that helps you, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's an element of divination in architecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an element sure. of, of uh, looking at sites seeing the equivalent of spores, if you yeah. will, uh, of feeling, having, having claims to feelings about a future form mm -hmm. that's uh, arising. Maybe take it from there. Or Actually, I wanted to talk more about the actual bones, oh, okay, go ahead. if I could. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever studied Chinese. I, I did for a while, and I really love the language. I think all of us can learn a great deal from understanding Chinese. And uh, the basic premise of the Chinese language is very different, almost the opposite of the languages of the Romance uh, world that we uh, deal with. So our languages tend to be a kind of logistical mechanism that takes very complex ideas and, and allows you to have a mathematical system of some number of word letters. So we have certain numbers of letters and we reconfigure them to make more complex ideas that have etymologies and so forth. In Chinese, they embed all of those meanings in what essentially they see as an object, the character. Mm -hmm. um, it's in, called indicative symbolism. Um, it's not a symbol. So for example, if you take the word for person, uh, you would think that the word for person would just be like a little symbol of a person, like arms outstretched and legs and a little head. Stick figure. Yeah, stick figure. There is that symbol. That symbol actually means big. It doesn't mean person. Their word for person, which we've talked about often, and this is a philosophical commentary that you can argue, is it's two things, uh, it's two strokes. And they say that, you know, you're, you're only a, a person if there's one other person in the world for you to know you're a person. You, you, you can't be a person if you're the only person in a world, in the world. There's nothing, this is their theory anyway. You, you need someone else to uh, compare yourself to, which was talked about in the expressions yesterday. And the word for I is similarly conflicting. Um, a word for I you'd think would just be a stroke. That, that's not what that means, but there is a stroke like that. But their word for I is two soldiers facing off, fists touching, and ready to kill each other hmm. because they see I as a permanent conflict. My point here is that the divinity bones point to this overarching heavily fundamental idea that their language is a philosophical uh, treatise all put together and um, every, every word you learn as a child you're told every one of those stories. You don't learn just well I means me you, you're told that I means you're in conflict with yourself. So they're already building up this kind of huge trajectory of, of a philosophical undertaking. And you can read the language on about four levels because every word often has a root and a sound, and the root means something else. So like the word for dream is uh, a picture of the moon with clouds and a forest underneath it. And, the, and you're, you learn that a dream is called evening trees, 
because you have a dream in the evening and it's like a forest of thoughts that come out of your head when you're asleep. Hmm. And so uh, I think that's why the, di the divinity bones are valuable to them, not so much it's that they've found them. these things and they've said, oh, these are nationalistic pride. I think they see them as an extension well, of their entire philosophical being. You know, I mean, yeah. I, think, uh, I think you're right. And that there's an irony in that, you know, um, that Mao simplified the language, yeah. right? And so it Thank God, because that's what I learned. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't learn the other ones. <laughs> those might be Maoist interpretations. Right? No, no, they, those existed before. And they yeah. went, yeah. then they go back to these very early. Yeah, exactly. Clay. Just a follow-up on that. Um, how would a triple O, in terms of those objects, if those objects were placed in a vault for 10,000 years and totally stripped of the sort of cultural relationships that are being talked about here, to use a sort of archaeological uh, metaphor, maybe. How would Triple O see those objects as they reemerge back into a world that has none of those sort of overlaid relationships? How would notions of like um, wouldn't it depend if they were shown uh, to translation Chinese? Translation or metaphor apply to those um, those objects that reemerge back into? Well, um, I think it would be a misconception to say that Triple O doesn't allow for any cultural relationships. It simply thinks that the thing has a reality apart from the cultural relationships. And of course, some of the relationships the thing enters in can retroactively reconstitute the object so it becomes dependent on those relationships. Yeah. And, so, and, you know, I have the category in, in my work of, of the dormant object, which I think applies perfectly in these mm -hmm. situations where the object is, uh, you know, no longer registered in the social world. And so, yeah. you know, something like the Dead Sea Scrolls, right, was, yeah. was for many centuries a dormant object. It's there hidden away in the cave, and, and suddenly it's found, and it reemerges. And when it reemerges, it erupts onto the world, reconfiguring contemporary relations with, with yeah, right. I mean, to me, that's the exciting there. thing yeah. about, about yeah. Graham's notion yeah. of the metaphor being inexhaustible. Or is it dormant right. object? I mean, that's yeah. Really yeah. yeah, sorry, that's okay, you used it more than I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear the last thing you were saying. Sorry. That, was, that was the exciting part about this notion of the inexhaustibility of the metaphor. Uh, yeah, but we, but we don't need us. translates a... and, tra and transitions through time. Right. I mean, I think it's worth just observing that we don't need a special a special cultural object for that to work. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the non-biodegradable uh, uh, filet fish <laughs> container <laughs> it has the same properties. Right. Uh, right. And we have to kind of face that reality. And, and with mm -hmm. you know the polar ice caps melting and these these ancient lakes are being revealed, who knows what sort of you know bacteria are lurking there from <laughs> tens of thousands of years ago? These are dormant objects as well. They were in a closed ecosystem and now they're being released out so into the uh, including uh, dust from the silver mines. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Does a dormant yeah. object when it's released always start as one of utility? Like I'm thinking of um, like the Wonder Boys quote that I showed, when that thing is released from its vault, it becomes a utilitarian, it becomes useful first, before it has no. a cultural meaning. No, in fact, no. it probably has mythical meaning first. First, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. But there was plague released in Siberia recently when the permafrost yeah. started melting. Right. Oh. I for, forgot which disease that was, but it killed a number of mm -hmm. Siberians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any mm. more questions from around the room? Over here. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. It's more of an observation, but interesting to hear any comments. When you all have mentioned, Michael, you mentioned that there is more tendency now with digital representation being just the end as opposed to actually having a builder and an interest in the building. And as a practitioner here in Austin, I find that it's almost the, in a sense, the opposite. And I may have misinterpreted in one of your writings way back like in the early 90s, but mm -hmm. as the internet and digital representation will get more and more um, ability to create spectacle, there will be more of a need for architecture I found that either in so the food restaurant industry or in architecture, you know, here in Austin there's a number of people who they know who all the cabinet makers are, they know who, you know, where the wood floor comes from. They provide to something good a restaurant and this this cheese came from this farm and everyone's very interested in sort of the makers and the origins of all the pieces and the <coughs> I guess you'd say in a very broad sense the essence of you know, of all the different parts. And I want people in my office, you know, some of the younger architects especially some of the very interesting I find encouraging. Maybe it's, it's obviously different in different architects. It's not I think different. I think uh, I'll just speak in very general terms because I think we have two people here more qualified on this. But 
Architects have long made buildings that didn't get built, whether that was digital or not, right? Uh, their buildings were, were fantasies and drawings um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So to some extent, the fact that we can now digitally render almost to the point of not being able to tell is this real or not, like literally, like the, the, the quality of rendering now has reached a point where it's indistinguishable from a photograph. Yeah. So I think it follows from that that a certain amount of satisfaction uh, will arise from someone having produced something with so much apparent realness that it's released into the world and actually has an influence through publications and through dissemination online. And in that sense, it is, a, it is an object. It's an object of the mind, you know, perhaps, like Hamlet. Um, but uh, so it qualifies, I think, in, in Graham's term as an object. Uh, but that doesn't make us unable to distinguish that from you know, a hamburger or, a, or what have you. I mean, the fantasy of cyberspace was that the digital realm, especially the uh, internet-connected digital realm, would reach such a pitch of uh, capacity and speed that we could reconstitute digital objects that had real consequences. So when you can now do your banking online, and half of us as academics you know, spend our time communicating online, that's a social network that has no real existence. My hope then was that that very fact, which I could see coming, would develop a counterweight appetite for things like food, clothing, texture, sex, architecture. And I wanted, I thought architecture could not follow, could not get into cyberspace without becoming something else. That was my thought then. So, yeah. And that that, and that what architecture could be is real, and I try to say what, what would real mean in that context. So I saw a kind of a fissioning going on. I'm not sure my colleagues would agree that. Yeah, I mean, Robin exactly. Evans are, would argue that there's no difference between drawing and digital drawing, that it's all speculation. Our profession is entirely about speculation. We don't build right. our buildings. Someone else builds our buildings. It's correct, we don't even build our buildings. We don't build our buildings, none of us, you know? Yeah. And, and But then the, the argument I would say for digital is that it allows but it wouldn't matter. Greater information. It, it allows more properties of a, of a design to be accessible to us. So, like big data, for example, a project to me is only digital when it involves more data than we're capable of containing in our minds. Um, okay. Because we can That's deal with. Yeah. It's that excess. So it's, it's only an excess. It's only beyond what we can contain. So big data, digital allows us to access big data in a way that we can't personally do it. That's only when it's. Digital. I think Craig wants to respond, and then we'll go to Cisco. Oh, okay. Yeah, probably one question. After. I um I wanted you said um, a rendering is 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 uh, like a photograph or it's, as good as a photograph. Can and I can you get that good? Yeah, and I was surprised by that comment because a photograph is also a representation. It's uh, right. So I mean, you know, you can. And someone brought it up the other day. The, the Roland Barthes definition of a photograph, which is it tell it shows you what it looks like, but it doesn't tell you what, anything about what's Susan in it. Sontag. Right. Yeah. Or Sun Talk. Um, the, there, there is a notion that a photograph changed the architectural profession too, right? So that before photographs, we, we didn't really think about buildings necessarily from how they might look in a frame. And then we started to deal with them in terms of views or in black and white photographs in terms of the textures that you see in photographs. So, you know, a, a photograph is as much of a, of a representation of a building as a rendering is. On the other hand, um, I would say <coughs> that, that uh, there is a, a photograph at least somehow could be understood as a, as a representation, as an artificial representation, whereas many reality-driven uh, uh, renderings or virtual reality-driven ways of seeing buildings are, are supposed to actually replace the real thing almost. That's the feeling, that's the attitude. I'm not saying that that's right, I'm just saying that's the attitude. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how relevant that is, but I would also like to comment on your notion of we don't build our buildings. Mm -hmm. I agree that it's a challenge if we don't build things. On the other hand, I'm not sure, even if you were a stonemason and you were making your own stone thing, you would still have to plan it out somehow. Brunelleschi, who built the dome, wasn't an architect. He was involved in the physical operations of making it, but he had to work through a planning process. Well, it's interesting, because, yeah, he, I mean, and Evans makes this point, which is that all of, like, Brunelleschi, they would put their drawings in the buildings. 
So you used the floor to actually construct the architecture. Yeah, that's true to an extent, but Brunelleschi yeah. made a lot of drawings and a lot of models. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're, they're, that's well documented. Mm -hmm. So they were working in the same speculative atmosphere that an architect would have to, um, especially because they didn't have anything else to hold all that information in place. Um, so I'm not sure that building our buildings is necessarily important, but I do think you have to make things which is what the uh, author was saying. What's uh, Crawford? Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, the act of m doing something, I don't care what the hell it is, but doing something to get your body going is super important because I think the physicalness of what we are is has value into the physicalness of what an object is. You call since it philosophy we make is vigorous art. Yes, I like that term. Philosophy is vigorous art. As opposed to philosophy's rigorous science, which is the crucial space. Did you know that, uh, I'm sure you probably heard this, uh, you, do you know anything about the enteric nervous system, this uh, nervous system that runs through your digestive tract? Yeah, yeah it's a weird talk on the, in, the mar uh, in the world out there right now, that there are as many neural cells in your digestive tract as a small dog has in its brain. Wow. And that goes back to the time when we didn't have particularly big brains, and our main feature was finding food and having sex. And so, uh, you know, there's this, uh, this world in there. And that's why when people sort of say they're thinking with their gut, that, that's actually not silly. There are yeah, actually neural cells in your, brain, in your stomach, um, and they are thinking. It's a primitive form of thinking. But I think it's... What are the, they doing? Are they vomiting inappropriate content? It <laughs> plays a, an important yeah. role in, in uh, our emotional states and depression. Okay. There's some concern because part of it's about bacterial flora as well. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so there's concern that all this use of things like bacterial soap and everything might be contributing to the rise in anxiety and depressive disorders, which, you know, you go to a psychoanalyst but, for 12 years but it, to treat these things. But it's more than that because that, an emotion is, it can so be, yeah, I mean, it can be affect your relationship to something. So, uh, you oh, know, yeah. I, I think that it, it suggests anyway that there is an instinctual system in our body that's very, very primitive that um, attaches to the aspirational thoughts that we have. Siska. Um, yeah, does it, uh, this may be a, question, but um, I feel incredibly out of my depth speaking. Yeah. But I think one of the things <laughs> so I think about identity has a lot to do with objects. And when I think about characteristics of identity, I think certain things we're very good at dealing with as designers, like uh, formal articulation or lack thereof. We have all sorts of tools for dealing with that question, but other ones maybe less so, like uh, the question about archaeology maybe about age, which I think when we see objects, we all have a sense of kind of an object's age. Or the one that really bothers me from time to time in the discussion they raise it is size. Like size seems like it has an incredible impact on the, the way we understand an object or a building. Scale or size? Size, right. Which I think that's one that has bothered me throughout my career at various times because I think the tools we have are incredibly uh, inept at, at gauging Size, right? Either we're dealing, we're working at scale, whether it's digital and you're on a screen or you're making models, you know, whether you're enlarging things or reducing things, oftentimes you're changing the size of something in order to understand its articulation better. Like, mm -hmm. you, know, you look at those microscopic photographs of some tiny insect, it helps you understand its articulation, but it takes away completely kind of the impact of its size in your perception of it. And so, my, my question is I don't know how to deal with this. As an architect, we talk about you know academic education is so much about methods, and we talk a lot about that. But I don't know that we have good tools for addressing the size of a building or an object. And does with all the collected wisdom in this room, is there something you can help mm -hmm. us with in terms of how methods that we can use to think about the impact of Graham? How, what do you what do you think of the quality of property? trying to wrap my head around the, uh, the concreteness of the problem here. What, what is the problem that arises as a designer when you can't get a grasp on the size? You draw something 10 feet tall and you don't really know what that means. Okay. Like, what is 10 feet tall? And then you have to go and say, oh, this room is 10 feet tall, now I get it. Or right. 100 feet tall. And it, it's hard back. for your brain to metastasize the dimensions of things often. Even I, after 40 years of working, I actually have a column. We have a column in our office with their feet on it. Mm -hmm. And on the floor, we have feet out on the floor. And when somebody says, let's make this 25 feet, we kind of go over there and go, oh, 
That's 25 feet. <laughs> so, so design yeah. software doesn't that's help you with this much? Yeah. No, that it's it horrifying. Worse. It makes it worse. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a much worse. It's a really good point. Zoom yeah. arbitrarily. Oh, I see, I see. I mean, I think Got that's you. a really good point because a lot, and we haven't really talked about tools, mm -hmm. but architects use tools, and a lot of the result of what we produce mm -hmm. is based literally on the function of that tool or the use of that tool. So like parametricism we talked about last night is a result of Grasshopper in using a very specific tool that is a very specific set of conditions. And I think that the, the interest we talked about is how do you create new tools right. that start yeah, to I engage mean, these new theories? Yeah, there are also feet. have drawn the human body. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but it'd be the modular man of yeah, the that your welfare. Yeah, right. yeah. And be able to exclude the body. At a certain size, great. if it's the scale of the body. body. The question of size, the one with the child, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there uh, are, and goes back to Michael's talk yesterday with I and you about and, and, and the description <laughs> of the language that was going through there. Or perhaps Michael takes joy in talking to a tree, okay, and a group of people do, and then year after year they talk to other trees. But then you have a forest which is really <coughs> true. And one measure that I heard in Delhi, the origins of that sun-baked city was that it was a dense, dark forest, and within that darkness, dreaming perhaps, there were a number of eyes, pairs of eyes. And they couldn't tell if the eyes ten feet away were their cousins or a tiger. So they have this relationship with animals because they're all in the darkness of the forest. There's 256,000 trees or something like that, which leads some people now to do uh, biophilic cities that, uh, or urban forests, that the definition of the city is really the forest again of dimness and darkness where we have to establish new relationships with humans and animals. I'm not giving you the answer, but one answer may be back at ourselves in this philosophical discussion, which is also architectural, which is our, about us as a congregation, as well as an individual on a lonely balcony or something like that. Yeah, I'm a it's just yeah, a modest, but it's primal. I'd like to respond, but go ahead, Ian. You're a guest. I was just going to I'm, I'm, I'm something of a, of a skeptic about um, virtual reality, but I think this is one case in which room scale virtual reality actually may make a difference in the very near term. Sure, it'll be more useful. It'll I be agree. more useful. Yeah. It's not a solution, yeah. but it, it's one it's one example of a, a, present, a tool that's, that's yeah. basically present today yeah. that, that will make a difference. I've actually spent quite a few, just coincidentally maybe, talking about size with my, my studio. And the fact that, um, and, I, and it's a mystery to me, why certain things, like the question was, if given a form, any form you like, a shape, I guess I should say, mm -hmm. does it have a natural size? Is there a size at which you would say, this is too big for it, in the sense that like its clothes don't fit, or that this is a miniature of something? Is there a proper size for things? Um, so, you know, you, the, the examples, uh, you know, miniature elephants uh, or gigantic ants. We know from structures, right, that there's a f uh, fourth power law that about uh, gravity, the strength of materials relative to gravity. So the reason you don't have gigantic ants is they would break their legs because of the strength of material. So there are discontinuities in the, the yeah, equations. But and that means that there is a, for an ant-shaped thing, there is a kind of a proper size. For an elephant-shaped thing, there's a, a proper size for, like, for elephants. And it's, it's why insects can fly for so long with so little energy. Like there are, there are nonlinear laws that are crossing over yeah, but you and to, making certain I phenomena happen. I think you're, I think you're kind of, I, I have uh, to say, I, uh, please, please finish. Okay. So the intuition is that there's a proper size for anything. And that I'm thrilled by the idea that structure, which is like beyond, it's not what you think, it's not about human scale, it's about what will break, or what can fly, or what will blow, be blown away. That sort of makes a certain form want to be a certain size. And I do think that architects play with it like nonstop. We make little things that seem big, we make big things seem little, we miniaturize, we, uh, we love to overscale, things because we get such a thrill out of small objects that are actually writ large. And I think pr practices like Kuhas and, and uh, Zaha and all these people, are, they're all making little things. <coughs> they're taking things that are properly jewelry and making them the size of city blocks. 
I, I want to re react to this. I, I think that you, the animal metaphor is a little bit of a simplification because of ant is the size that it is because of millions of years of evolution, I think, and yeah. things dying off. You don't have a million years to sort out a new ant. So if someone gives you a strange new program, like I want to have a room that's got, you know, this kind of things going on and these sort of people meeting and that sort of room doesn't exist. Uh, right now, nobody's making that kind of room. You, you have to kind of somehow figure it out. You don't, you don't go through a long process, but you have to go through some kind of process to find out the right size. So you, it's harder, I think, than just saying, well, everything has its right size. And the other thing um, that I would say is that, um, well, first of all, a little aside, I, this is a belief, in my opinion, that an architect's gift is to make big things little. Because there is, we have a certain scale, as you say, humans are a certain size. We can only deal with certain kinds of things. Um, so you, you, you know, some things are much larger. Our, our needs are much bigger than our bodies. So you have to bring them back to our bodies. So I think that fits into what you're trying to say. But I did want to say uh, a couple more things. In terms of size versus scale, uh, there was a great project, I remember, by Sia Armigiani. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, there have like three of the things he did that I just fell in love with and then 50 that I hated, so I just focus on the ones that I really love. Uh, and he made this project which was called A Tower for Humanity. And uh, remember that? It was, it was a 14,000 mile high tower. <laughs> and its top was in geocentric orbit. And its bottom sat 15 inches off the ground, right, because the centrifugal force of the Earth wanting to throw it out into space equaled the gravitational pull of wanting to hold it onto the ground so it didn't have to touch the ground, you know? Or you build an apartment building where you build it around the Wait, girth of the Earth. So it was, the base was floating? Yeah, it never needs yeah, to touch. Yeah, it's being flung out. Yeah. 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 Enough to okay. So if it's 14,000 miles high, it makes it light and delicate. So he did some math. Yeah, and the other one was the, the apartment building that went in, in the girth of the earth. So you start building the apartment building. You have to start on the ground because it's going to hit the ground. But as you build it around the earth and eventually get back to that side and join them together, the spin of the earth is going to mean that you could pull all the foundations away, right? It'll be like a little ring, like Saturn, Saturn's <coughs> ring, and it won't have to touch. So this is an idea where the massiveness of something makes it actually lighter more delicate and, and more, more reasonable. So I think you can stretch, stretch those things in different ways. The last thing I wanted to say very quickly was you used the word identity, which is a word I'm very nervous of. I think I always say, what the hell does that mean? And it includes the word id, which I believe means a singular thing. Like um, identity, I thought maybe it, means it. It means it, yeah. yeah. As a, and we often use it as architects to represent a larger cultural thing, like it has an identity for all of us, as opposed to its own identity. Like there's a schism there between its identity that it wants to be and the proposal that an architect would suggest that it has an identity for all of us. And I always have a, I think it's a buzzword. Yeah, yeah but it was used, but I mean, I, I, used it as a unique like, number. Yeah. That's probably my fault because I, I do, endorse the word identity in the philosophical context is because yeah. we've passed through this period where difference and <coughs> kind of anti-essentialist atmosphere has been in the air and mm. I think something has been lost. Yeah. For example, I can see why people are suspicious of the word essence in a political context, yeah. but I think the problem is the claim to know the essence, not, not the fact that there is an essence. And I run into this problem with Edward Said, who, of course, being in Egypt, I wanted to read him a lot. Yeah. He was still alive when I got there and I read his newspaper columns every day and so forth. Um, Saik gets into a bind in Orientalism because on the one hand he says, um, um, well, I'll put it this way. He says you can't talk about, say, Arab culture. There are just many different people, right? You can't overgeneralize and create a stereotype about Arab culture. But, when, but then, okay, fine. But then when you shift to saying you can only talk about individual Arab people, that's Margaret Thatcher saying society doesn't exist. So Can you, you solve the problem by uh, adding an S? Arab cultures? Yeah, but then there's going to be a finite number of them. And if you keep complaining, no, you can't say there's a Jordanian culture because there's just individual Jordanians, yeah. at a certain point, you're going to get to Margaret Thatcher's position where there's just a bunch of people and families. I've had this problem. And, like I'd say, when sometimes people say, I'm going to make this for the community. Right. And I say, well, who's that? 
you know, people shut the up community. To yeah. People are shut up to people, yeah. You know, but often when you look at a community, it's it's made of several very unusual and interested groups, and right. and and if we conglomerate everything, we tend to miss the subtlety. So I, I hear what you're saying, but I think there's maybe a middle ground. Well, perhaps if we you know abandon the concept of culture and replace it with something like ecology, and it seems to me mm. that there are distinct ecologies like the Great Barrier Reef, the Amazonian rainforest, that mm. all have difference in diversity, yet they are still mm. singular entities at some sense, this might, you know, respond to some of mm. Saeed's legitimate concerns about, you know, these sorts of generalizations. So I'm of the 24th Street also. ecology. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, the <laughs> <word> speculative realism <laughs> was an ecology. It was something right. that came into existence and that has, yeah. you know, spread in certain ways um, within the philosophical world. Uh, so my, I had a student in Egypt who spoke perfect English, and he, his job was to telemarket at night from Cairo to the U.S., and so he first had to take a culture, American culture course. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating to hear what he learned in that course. And one of the things was, when you call Americans to sell them something, you can't ask them if they're married. You can't ask them what their salary is. And this is revealing because Egyptians do that a lot. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah, these ta taxi drivers will ask me if I'm married. Yeah. Or they'll ask me how much I make. Very personal. Yeah. Which here, that you'd never do that. <clears throat> and um, <coughs> I don't think it's a problem to say there is an Egyptian culture that differs in certain respects from American culture. I think the problem that Saeed is legitimately worried about is when someone claims to know the culture and to say, yeah. I'm sitting in the British Foreign Office, yeah. the Arabs the Arabs are inherently undemocratic yeah. and they need a viceroy. This is where you get into the problems. Yeah. I don't yeah. see a problem with saying there is an essence of Arab culture, we just yeah. can't quite know what it is, we can't, we have yeah. to be careful about generalizing about it. Yeah. So, and I think that goes for all objects. I have no yeah, problem with so, the term essence as so long as just it's... just replace yeah. Arab culture with architecture. That pretty much yeah. describes the situation. Yeah. 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 I'm unsympathetic. We can know about it. We can, like, there's an essence there somewhere, we just can't know it. I've been very unsympathetic to the arguments of people like Richard Rorty, that you can't say there's such a thing as philosophy. There's just many different philosophies that are different yeah. practices. Or yeah. You can't say there's such a thing as art. I think, I think you can. Yeah. You just have to realize that it's... You're not going to nail it. The essence is, um, is yeah. inaccessible in some way. But doesn't that go back to what you were speaking about earlier with, with over-literalism? I mean, this is a problem that we tend to mistake the language for the reality that yep. we're trying to capture with it. Right. And um, to segue that into a question, it seems like... This will have the, to be the, the last question. The core trajectory of Triple O is to try and achieve escape velocity from our deeply ethnocentric perspective. And so... Anthropocentric, you mean? Yes, yes. Um, and so, you know, this far into the journey, how, how successful do you think that escape velocity is? I mean, because it's, it feels like we're still struggling with this slippery slope of being constantly sucked back into our own perspective. Oh, yeah, that's inevitable. Of, you know, uh, you know, like uh, really mistaking the, the symbol for the reality that it's trying to represent of, of privileging human-made objects over... He thinks we're correlationists still. Mm. Well, maybe. <laughs> Well, but I think we're doing pretty well. There's triple O popping up all over the place, and I think people to some extent are getting it, even if you still hear things that I would call misinterpretations, but they don't bother me that much, unless they're made in a philosophical context, mm -hmm. where I feel at home. Mm -hmm. and, I can, and I can say, no, you're wrong about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> like, when, when I mentioned that the guy at the, you were at the art conference in Central France a few years ago, and the guy asked me that question, what would art without humans be like? Oh, yeah. And I didn't know how to answer it, and I realized it was a badly formed question, because we're not trying to get rid of humans. We're trying to talk about what's there that humans can't accept. Well, yes, that's, that's something that came up again and again and again. This yeah. is why when you said, well, what are the political implications of the democracy of objects? Right. Well, you know, one of the claims immediately by ungenerous Galloway. Uh, yeah, people was, was that somehow we're trying to say, what was it? It was the- Humans uh, the, are equal the, to garbage. Or the corporation, right? The, oh, the, the, the corporation right. is uh, is more important than humans. Uh, oh, they, they were saying- and that, so there yeah. was this this idea that to point out that corporations exist is to suddenly, is to suddenly say they are wonderful they're things. Better. It's to the, support the, the Citizens United you know, decision. Right. 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 <laughs> And that's that's why it's important to make this distinction right. between you know ontological claims and, and yeah. ethical political right. claims. Right. You know, certainly nobody's my, making my the claim that the bubonic plague that, is uh, that you know, using the word democracy and yeah. parliament in connection with that yeah. is a rhetorical move yeah, in is. exactly that direction, yeah. and it's not innocent. No. I think there are more neutral ways yes. to make that point. Unless you're in terms. speaking Chinese, and then you'd find an indicative symbol. That would <laughs> that yeah. would I mean, these days, I was in the hierarchy of objects. I'm going to close the proceedings uh, by stages. 
a little bit like our Friday forums. I'm going to see a formal close, which will simply involve thanking everyone for coming back on a Saturday morning, on a beautiful Saturday morning, having this fabulous conversation. Uh, and a special debt to you, Graham, for your thought and your presence uh, in stimulating uh, all of us. I think you've been, I'd like to give a special hand to Graham. So I say close by stages because I'm going to say this is the formal end. Uh, some of us need to go down the hall for a minute. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I'd like to think that we'll hang out for just another 15 or 20 minutes for informal conversation um, and just let it wind down like that. So thank you all for coming, every one of you. I truly, truly appreciate it. This is the end of our Secret Life of Conference. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.